Welcome live to Sebring, Florida, and the revival of a sports car racing tradition like no others, the Sebring 12 Hours. It may not be the longest race in motorsports, but it is certainly the toughest. Sebring, one of the most famous circuits in the world. Just a mention of the historic track brings back memories of more than 60 years of racing. Legends of the past, like Fangio, Gurney, Andretti, and Phil Hill, were some of the first to conquer one of the toughest tracks in all of motorsport. But Sebring is more than a race. It's an annual pilgrimage for race fans to bask in racing's rich past and embrace the future. Different eras have had their champions. Ferrari, Porsche, Audi, and Corvette have all claimed dominance under the Florida sun. But today brings the beginning of a new world order at Sebring. The year began with the Rolex 24 at Daytona. No problem. Oh! And now, the Tudor United Sports Car Championship, the unification of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series and the American Le Mans Series, presented by Tequila Patron, brings the future of sports car racing to Sebring for race number two in this historic season. Four classes of prototypes and touring cars will crowd the track and fight the blinding sun and empty blackness of night. The men behind the wheel and behind the wall fighting exhaustion throughout. Who will be left standing when the clock runs out and the checkered flag waves? When the smoke clears, who will be crowned champion of this new era? Find out now as the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring begins on Fox Sports 1. the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring presented by Fresh from Florida. Back on New Year's Eve in 1950, no one could have predicted that Hendricks Army Airfield hosting its first sports car race would become one of the true iconic events and tracks in all the world of motorsports. Over the years, Hendricks Field became Sebring International Raceway and that first six hour race on New Year's Eve became the world renowned 12 hours, now ready for its 60 second running. Once again, all of the greatest sports car drivers and teams in North America and some from abroad are here as well to earn one of the greatest honors that you can in sports car racing. Hi everybody, I'm Bob Varsha. Welcome live here on Fox Sports. Our story is something old and something new. Let's start with the new. This is round two of the new for 2014 Tudor United Sports Car Championship. It's also round two of the series within the series, the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup, which offers big prizes to the top performing teams in the four longest races on the schedule, a total of 52 hours. And of course, you'll see them all here on Fox. As for the old, well, look around you. Sebring International Raceway is a living museum of motorsports. The Hunter, the uh, airfield circuits, the concrete ra uh, racetrack that the drivers first took to in 1950 remain. So when you come here to race at Sebring, you are truly running in the tire tracks of all the greatest names in motorsports. Joining me to bring you the action are my season-long colleagues, Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. Let's start with what's old about Sebring, Calvin. I think uh, Porsche factory driver Patrick Long said it best. What you hate about Sebring is what you love about Sebring. This place is an all-day sucker. Absolutely, Bob. And over the years, the racetrack layout has changed a handful of times, but one thing remains the same. The backbone and character of Sebring will wear you down. It is rough, it is tough, it is the most brutal 12 hours of motorsports in anywhere in this world. Now, for the teams, their preparation needs to be spot on. For the cars, durability will always be the big question mark. And for the drivers, you simply have to be patient. There's a lot of traffic to deal with. And certainly during the course of this race, a race car that may have seemed perfect in qualifying or practice, suddenly in the heat of the day, it gets away from you. You've got to wait for those cool evening hours and wait for that sweet spot to come back to you. And Dorsey, if you can do that and get to victory lane, it is the ultimate satisfaction. Well, I agree totally. Sebring is the very toughest of all the endurance events in the world. It's because of the roughness we talk about. There's bumps out there so severe it knocks the wind out of you. You come out of this whether you win or lose like you've been in a fight. You're sore everywhere. And if you had a bad weekend, it's easy to hate this place. And that's why we keep coming back year after year. 
No question about it. It is also the biggest party in motorsports. Now, as for picking a winner, well, start with the winners of the season opener in Daytona. The number five Corvette from Action Express, an international driver lineup. They will start on pole here in round two at Sebring. Chris Neville is with the man who put the car on pole. Yeah, Bob, Action Express trying to pick up right where they left off at Daytona, become the first team to win the Rolex 24 and Sebring in the same year since 1998. Sebastian Bourdais got the pole yesterday, got the win at the Rolex 24. Sebastian, both races very challenging. Some say this racetrack the most challenging in the world. How do these races compare? Uh, they're very hard to compare. I mean, you go to Daytona where you have a lot of rest on the oval and very smooth racetrack and not so many corners. Here you come and there's no rest. It's super bumpy, different track conditions, different pavement, uh, very bumpy, and uh, it's going to get hot. So tough, tough place. Well, for more on these teams on the front row, Andrew Marriott. But only one point. Just point one of a second behind is the Oak Racing Nissan. Olivier Pla put down a great lap. He's already in the car. I'm with a fine young second generation driver, Alex Brundle. Now, you're in this lightweight European car. How does it compare? Where are your strong points compared with the DPs? Well, obviously, off the start, Ollie's got a hell of a job on his hands uh, to keep uh, the row of DPs that he's got behind him behind. Uh, see us potentially struggling a little bit in the early laps. We generate tyre temperature a little bit more slowly. So, again, early laps laps might be a problem. Straight line speed is the massive thing. The DPs have more straight line speed than us. Where we're strong, high speed corners, 17, 1. This early phase of the lap around the pit straight area is, is potentially where we're going to be able to pull out a bit of an advantage. Thanks very much and I'll throw it back to the booth. Nice All right, thanks very much gentlemen. The field is 64 cars strong, split into four categories. The pure racing prototypes, the spec car prototype challenge and the GT categories. The busiest classes in the Tudor United Sports Car Championship, the GT Le Mans car and the GT Daytona class. It'll be busy, it will be difficult, there will be lots of traffic. In fact, since 2000, the size of the field for this event rarely broke 40 cars. We have more than 20 more than that here today, so you can imagine what it's going to be like. In fact, every driver you speak to up and down the pit lane will tell you, in addition to the difficulty of the racetrack, there is the difficulty of getting around and even coexisting with your competitors through a long day of racing. We have perfect weather. As you look at our onboard cameras, Drivers in the office, as it were, ready to go to work. We expect temperatures of about 80 degrees. The track will be in bright sunshine all day. It will be hot, it will be slick, and it will be an awful lot of fun. Now it's time to get things started. So let's go down to the start-finish straightaway to hear the most famous words in motorsports from the Mobile One Global Motorsports Manager, Mr. Artis Brown. You can see the count, it's on you. Drivers! Start your engines! That is how you... Engines are fired. The cars will shortly be on track. We'll take a break. When we return, you'll meet the rest of our Fox Sports team here at Sebring, and we'll get one of the greatest races on the planet underway. Stay with us. Sebring is, is that kind of place that seems to escape time. It's hot, it's bumpy, um, it's mixed conditions. It's very hard, it's very physical, it's very strong, hot, and uh, exciting. It's only a 12-hour race compared to 24 hours, but it's as hard on drivers and cars as probably a 36-hour, 48-hour race. <laughs> Welcome back to the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, the 62nd running of this great event. And just 
a few moments away from the drop of the green flag. I'm Brian Till along with Tommy Kendall and Justin Bell, part of your broadcast crew. We'll be bringing you the action. Now, the guys talked about prototype cars a little bit earlier, but three other classes also running here at Sebring and in every Tudor United Sports Car Challenge event. And that is the prototype challenge. Those are a spec category. It's another prototype car. All the chassis are the same, same power plant, same tires. The GT categories, that's where the interest comes in because that's where the manufacturers really are. GT Daytona though, Tommy, we think about the Rolex 24, maybe we should have called it the Rolex 28 for the GT, Day Day GT Daytona category. Took a little while to get that one sorted out. Well, when we went off the air there, they had just uh, promoted the uh, Flying Lizard Audi into victory lane because of an on-track incident. It since got reversed and the Turner Motorsports car was restored the win. So it was not terribly elegant, but elegant's not a word that people usually use to describe racers. So <laughs> the key takeaway though was it was an unbelievable finish and I think most people think they got it right in the end. So uh, that's what I think people remember going forward. Uh, packed field in GT Daytona. Expect more of the same here. Yeah, level five took the victory in the Ferrari, but GT Le Mans, both of you guys have been factory race car drivers. You know what it means to support that factory and do, go to war. It's going to be a war in GT Le Mans here today, Justin. Absolutely. I think all week I've described it as a battle of the giants because, I mean, rear engine, mid-engine, front-engine, you've got Corvette, you've got BMW, you've got Viper. It's quite extraordinary. Remember, each car just capable, just as capable of a fast lap round here, but they get there in slightly different ways. Well, and the fastest GT Le Mans category car at the Rolex 24, the one who took the checkered flag, was Porsche. And it's been a while since Porsche has stood on the top of the victory podium here at Sebring in the GT category. It was the last one in 2008 in GT. But Michael Christensen has put his 911 RSR on pole here. And Porsche looking to make it two for two in 2014 with a win here at Sebring. For more, Chris Neville is with our pole sitter in GT Le Mans. Well, that's right, Brian. Between the Rolex 24 and Sebring, Porsche has racked up 143 victories. And yesterday in qualifying, it was Sebring rookie Michael Christensen that put Porsche on pole. And Michael, one thing we hear with endurance racing is it's always take your time with these races. Make sure you have a car underneath you. But we're searing a little bit more of a sense of urgency this year because of the traffic. Is this race going to change? This race is going to be very difficult. You know, it's uh, a lot of traffic. That's going to be a really tight uh, fight in the end of the race. All of, all of the GT LM cars is very uh, close together, so obviously it's not going to be that patient as it used to be, I guess, because we're so tight. We need to, need to take the chances on the right time, but also we need to be clever and not do, uh, do some damage to the car. Well, Porsche hoping for back-to-back -back victories in the first two rounds of the Tudor Championship. For more on GTD, Andrew Marriott. Well, there's drama for the GTD pole sitter here because I'm with Dale Cameron and uh, we're in the pit lane. So you're not going to make the start, you're going to start from pit lane. What's happened? Yeah, we had a small little uh, mechanical issue in warm up. Uh, it's all resolved now, no problem. But it's a really tight turnaround between warm up and getting out of pit lane in time for the recon, and we missed that by about five seconds. So, uh, yeah, not a nice feeling to, to give it away when you work so hard to stick it on pole. But uh, so we'll start from pit lane. Long race, 12 hours. Got a great team in uh, Turner Motorsports, some good co-drivers, and a uh, great BMW Z4, so it'll be fun. Yeah, well, that means you've got a lot of work to do. So uh, we'll watch how that BMW carves through the field. And uh, let's go now to Darren Law, who's taken part in 12 of these Sebring 12 hours, but now he's in the pit lane for us. Hey guys, first off, I want to say hi to Mamo Gidley back home. I know he's watching the broadcast. He was my teammate at Daytona this year. Had a very scary crash, and uh, we're, we're cheering for you, buddy. Have a good recovery. I'm here with Duncan Endy, who is the teammate to Bruno Junquera. They qualified on pole with a very, very fast time. Duncan, you guys have been fast every single session, top three every session. Uh, Bruno went out, and this is a really tight class, and he put it on pole by eight tenths of a second. Were you surprised at that? I, absolutely. Everybody was surprised about that. You haven't seen a lot of gaps like that in any class, let alone the spec class. Normally, it's really tight fought, really, really close between us, between Colin, between Ringer. There's, the driving talent out there is immense, but Bruno just threw down yesterday, and I haven't seen like anything like that in a long time. No, he did a great job. These guys qualified second last year and finished fourth. They know how to get it done. Definitely a contender for this weekend. All right, thanks very much, Darren. Sebring is the kind of racetrack that can give up that kind of a performance to a particularly inspired driver. Remember back in the 1980s when Hans Stuck took Bob Aiken's Porsche 962 around this place and took pole by four seconds. Don't see that much anymore. That's no, you think, do not. Uh, 
the balance of performance has certainly been tightened up. Even since Daytona, there's been some adjustments to try and get all of these cars on a level playing field. And really, hats off to the series. Done a great job under very difficult circumstances with the merger since last year with two different, very different series. There's a look at some of the onboard cameras we'll be showing you during the day. We have a lot of them here, too. So that's going to be some good viewing throughout this 12 hour. The great thing is you'll see, we talked about the rough nature of this racetrack, you'll see it from inside the cockpit for sure. A record crowd is expected. As they come down the back straightaway, named for Alec Ullman, the Florida businessman whose idea it was to create a racetrack out of an army training base here in the Citrus Groves of Florida. You see the various class starting grids and our continental scroll across the top of your screen. We expect the Corvette safety car to pull off and will begin the race across the front row. The perfect example of what the Tudor United Sports Car Championship is all about with a representative of the former American Le Mans Series prototype division and a Grand Am Rolex Series Daytona prototype. And now the hammer comes down. The green flag is in the air and we're underway at Sebring. Balbosa takes the lead. Look at Ricky Taylor in the Velocity Worldwide Machines. He stuffs it down the inside of Olivier Pla. They're side by side through turn one. Ricky Taylor really timed that perfectly. Got to the inside. He knows this track very well. And now the track narrows down. You would expect these Daytona prototype configuration cars, the cars that currently one two, they're heavier. Their tires should come in a little bit quicker than the lightweight P2 cars, Dorsey. That's a very good point, Calvin, with that extra weight that do come in quicker. The lighter weight cars take about another half a lap longer before they can really get maximum grip. Through Gurney Bend and down towards one of the signature quarters here at Sebring International, the hairpin. Right now, you just want to keep it clean. You want to get those tires, pressures up, temperatures up. There we see a little bit of side-by-side -side action. I think that's Pruitt going through. First gear hairpin down there. You come all the way up through into fourth gear right here. They break for turn 10. We'll see a lot of overtaking into this corner during the 12 hour. Scott Dixon looking pretty racy in the 0-2 car. Two Chip Ganassi racing entries here once again, just like we saw at Daytona. It was a rough road at Daytona for the Chip Ganassi squad running that new Ford EcoBoost engine, but they've come back strong. Looked very good in practice here this week. Barbosa trying to stretch a lead now, make it a little car more comfortable for himself. Nobody breathing down his neck. Into the Lamar corner. Very important because it sends you on to that long back straightaway. Good idea right there. Good view of how rough this racetrack is. That's all concrete. It was laid in 1942. Yep, it's a little bumpy. Long back stretch down into turn 17. This is the bumpiest corner on the racetrack and one of the highest speed. You and just bucket through here. It's tough to find the line. Even when you get it right, you still think, I left a little bit on the table. When you try and go quicker, you'll end up in the wall. I just figured you got it right if you make it onto the front straightaway. <laughs> <laughs> Joao Barbosa for Action Express, the hottest team in the Tudor United Championship right now, leads them through lap one. It's hard to say you can grab a championship by the scruff of the neck, but they've certainly done it so far. That turn one is so fast, it's so difficult because it's totally blind. The walls are taller than the car, so you can't see where the landing zone is, if you want to call it that, where it goes back and narrows down onto the new pavement that was put in some years back. Good to see the 10 car running strong right now. Got a text from Wayne Taylor about 20 minutes ago saying we've got some electrical issues. Seems like they've got those sorted out. Hopefully, this racetrack will sort it out if it doesn't. It is punishing, Dorsey. I mean, it will really dive deep into that race car and find any weak link. That's the P2 cars are the lighter weight machines, but they have experience here over 12 hours. The Daytona prototypes, you think they're more robust, but this is a very different nature racetrack. A certain oscillation they may not have experienced before can give you problems during the course of these 12 hours. And with the extra weight of those cars and with the shock load of coming off the ground with the wheel and slamming back down, axles, rear gears, things like that, differentials break here at Sebring. Things that never break anywhere else, well, it'll break here. On board the Porsche factory, 911 RSR, leader in GT Le Mans. But there's that bright yellow Corvette right on the gearbox. Menacing, I would call that. Ollie Gavin right there. Corvettes didn't show the outright speed in qualifying. Very tight qualifying field. I think five cars were separated by just over two tenths in the GTLM field. Porsche on the pole, then two BMWs, then the Corvettes. 
It's going to be a fascinating battle. Guys being really tender with the curbs. They're not running all over the curbs right now. Remember, those curbs are just adding more vibration, more bumps to what is already a really bumpy enough track. And we talk about the difficulty of this racetrack. The irony of Sebring International is that's the reason teams love to come here and test. This is one of the busiest racetracks in the country. Despite the modest spectator amenities and those for the teams, for that matter, it's wide open, it is brutal, and this is the place you come to test. Because if you could survive Sebring, you could survive anything. It's yes. the ultimate test bed. Go to even Audi and uh, Porsche were here just last week testing in preparation for Lamar. They feel you can survive 12 hours here. You can probably do 48 hours anywhere else because it'll just really wear the equipment down. It tests the drivers, too, because if you're not in 100% physical shape, they will show here. You know, you do an hour stint here, and you'll see guys coming out of the race car looking like they've just been beaten. I mean, absolutely drenched in sweat. And then you're going to see really athletic guys that come out and haven't even broken a sweat yet. This is the place that makes man for sure. British driver Nick Tandy are on board with him, chasing the number 56 BMW of Dirk Mueller. Two GTLM class cars. Oh, look at Tandy down the inside. This is tight quarter racing early in the going. This is where you can throw it all away. You can have a little bit of damage in that first hour. will come back and haunt you later in the event. But Tandy's certainly making his intentions known. That's for third in class. Meanwhile, the 94 GT Daytona class BMW hits the pit lane. Brilliant pull by Dan Cameron yesterday. Just squeaked it by a hundredth of a second over Lee Keen. But problems in the warm-up, and hopefully they're not continuing right now. No obvious damage as far as flat tires or normal things. That oh, you would penalty expect. box. Penalty box. He's been uh, called he's through. Got, he's got a drive through. It's got to be something from the start where he uh, improved his position or popped out of line or something he's getting the drive through for. Just got to stay calm, though. It, it's uh, not easy, but you can get laps back with the safety car. Caution Perez, there's a procedure that we'll dig into as this race progresses, but um, it's not over. You think, oh, boy, boy, you know, we're a lap down or whatever as the leaders now come down the front straightaway, but just got to stay cool, Dorsey. Absolutely right. I think the year I won this race, we were at 1.2 laps down, but doesn't mean a thing. There's a long way to go. Westbrook down the inside of the Starworks entry. Good clean pass there. He let his intentions known early. That's what you should do. So the other driver knows that uh, you're going to make an attempt. Too early to be you know, messing up right now in a 12-hour race. On board a P2 configuration prototype, Scott Pruitt, multiple-time champion in the Rolex series in the Daytona prototype. Let's see how they stack up as they accelerate down towards the hairpin. We've seen throughout the weekend, there's a new bump down there on the entrance to the hairpin. You may have your opponent all lined up, then all of a sudden, your world goes off the rails. We'll take a break and return live to Sebring. Welcome back to the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring here on Fox Sports. There you see the race and championship leader, the number five Corvette from Action Express in the hands of Brazilian uh, Portuguese driver João Barbosa, who took it to the checkered flag in Daytona seven long weeks ago. Well, we talked about Sebring International, the racing surface basically unmolested since 1950. The track itself, though, the configuration has changed, Dorsey. Well, the town of Sebring, Florida, and the racetrack is exactly in the middle of Florida, right north of Lake Okeechobee. Sits the old airport, and it's still active on some of the runways. The unique thing about this, of course, is it's eight. This is the eighth configuration, 17 turns, 13.74 miles. But all of this part of the racetrack is concrete that was laid in 1942. In fact, in the original configuration of about five miles, the cars would go all the way out to the actual airport runways. The place would shut down for the weekend. That's the reason that the track originally changed configuration was so that airplanes could fly in and out. An absolutely calendar perfect day here at Sebring. Temperature about 63, expected to gain about perhaps 15 degrees under bright sunny, sunny skies and a light Florida breeze. Yeah, you couldn't ask for better. It's good for the drivers. Nice, cool wind today. The engines will be making good horsepower. Let's have a look at our Rolex keys to victory. Not that those guys in the five car need to know, Cal. Well, bumps in the road, Bob. That can mean the rough surface that you're going to deal with and also any problems. Can you recover from those? Play nice. Traffic, four classes, 63 cars. It's going to be tough out there today. And the unknown, how will the DP and the P2 stack up here this weekend with the balance of performance changes? And will that DP configuration car survive 
12 hours here at Sebring. That is a key to the Tudor United Sports Car Championship for all of the cars in the former Grand Am Rolex Series. They have not raced here. So all of the information they're gathering is brand new. To Chris Neville. Well, we've got 60 drivers going toe-to-toe -to -toe on the racetrack and another 120 down here in pit lane enjoying the broadcast. Tony Kanon down here trying to get some rest, some relaxation. You guys didn't have the Daytona that you were hoping to. Brought the new Ford EcoBoost engine out. Didn't go the way that it typically does for Ganassi, but you guys have had some time to test now. Are you guys ready for this race? Oh, for sure. I think, you know, uh, just just the team and Ford, they did a lot of work since, since then. You know, it's a new engine, and... Uh, I think we're ready. We're ready to do it. The car is much better here, I think. And, uh, you know, the fuel, though, it's so much tighter than it was in Daytona. I think it's going to be a, a great race. Yeah, it seems like at Daytona, none of the drivers were really happy with how the car was performing. Have you guys kind of finally got the car tuned up the way you want it? Well, we're always going to complain about something, but uh, I think here we have a, you know, a better car than we had at Daytona, for sure. We have, there's a lot more downforce in these cars we have with the, you know, the under trail and the, the, the different nose. So uh, I'm happier here than I was at Daytona for sure. And you're also feeling a little bit under the weather. Are you going to be okay to drive? You know, the good part about when you're sick is when you get in the car, that goes away. So I'll be fine. All right, get some rest. Hopefully that's all of it go away. <laughs> when he gets in the car. Tony always has the high downforce nose on himself, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're a fine one to talk. <laughs> That three and a half liter Ford EcoBoost twin turbo six cylinder engine is quite the project. It's fun to go by. The two teams that are running it, the Ganassi boys and the uh, Mike Shank racing with Kerb Agajanian. They have and been working relentlessly on that uh, package. The engine bay changes with every race. Yeah, it's not the engine itself. I mean, there's a lot of cooling issues that go along with the trying to package that in the back of one of these cars. There's not a lot of air going in the back side of one of these cars. They're, they're void of air, if you will, and uh, the engine suffers. It gets hot from all that. Checking the action of the GT Daytona class. There's the 007 TRG AMR Aston Martin Vantage. Qualified fourth, and James Davison certainly making a statement here for himself and TRG in that Aston Martin V12 Vantage. I mean, Kevin felt he had a really good car. They showed their pace early in the week, and uh, everyone said, what are you doing? Because there's always the threat of a uh, balance of a performance change. But uh, he knew what they had, and eventually everyone puts their cards on the table come qualifying, and it was very, very tight in GTD. Here we're on board with Lee Keen in the WeatherTech Porsche. Here the drivetrain whine, typical Porsche noise there down into the hairpin. See the number on the side of the car that was lit up there, the number three. That's something that's new. It's really cool, too, because tonight, no matter if you can see the car or not, you'll see that number three. It means that the car is running third in its class at this point in the race. All the cars carry those numbers in different colors, depending upon which class the car runs in. You see it? It's called the leader light system. It's a great innovation for all the fans around the racetrack. Right now it shows third, but timing and scoring shows that car second. <laughs> Perhaps it'll adjust when he gets around to start finish. And not far behind is Ben Keating in the one GTD class Viper in the field. Ben Keating, one of the biggest Viper dealers in the world. And there it is from Riley Technologies. This is a tremendous performance by Ben Keating. Two of the class out there today, GTD and LMPC, are what we call pro-am categories, where half of your driver lineup at least has to be made up of what we call a silver grading or bronze grading, which these are guys who typically aren't making their living from driving race cars. Ben is one of those guys, but he's certainly been through the ranks, had great success in Vipers, and was really itching to get in this series driving a Viper. He went to Riley, they've built this car, and the fact that he, as a pro-am driver, is running up in the top three really is a show when you get Bleak and Holland behind the wheel, what is that car's potential? And getting a two-time champion in the Spec Viper series here in the United States. So don't confuse a non-professional with a non-skilled driver. Battle for the lead here in PC, and these are a couple professional grade drivers, Bruno Jamkira, Tom Kimber Smith, giving them a good run. This is pretty cool. Junkier, what a lap he laid down in qualifying. Typically, we see the field split by hundreds. He was seven, eight tenths clearer of the rest of the field in LMPC. He found something, found the sweet spot. Just the tires came in perfectly. And Bruno, as we know, is so talented. We've watched him for many years on the verge of an F1 career, Bob. And had great success in the Champ Car Series. But when you look at him being out there, that really shows the class of this uh, category in terms of the drivers that it attracts. 
former pole sitter for the Indianapolis 500. Closest battle on the racetrack in class right now, and that's no surprise. Oh. Prototype Challenge is a spec series. All the cars are the same, chassis, engine, and tires. Now, and here's a dilemma. This. this is exactly what I want to talk about. Look at the back of that, and you've got the prototype cars much faster who have caught a gaggle of GT cars, different classes there. And this is what you have to deal with. You cannot pass them because there's nowhere to go. There's too many. You'll lose a handful of seconds. Barbosa, the leader, is clear. Look, he's all the way down in the hairpin, and Ricky Taylor is right in the middle of this mess. And right behind him comes Olivier Pla, and then one of the extreme motors. Well, I think a Scott Sharp there right in the mix as well. And this is playing well together, Calvin, what you were talking about right there. It would be very easy to get over-anxious and start bumping and banging and knocking off some of the bits of your car that you don't want to do that this early in a 12-hour race. You can't do it, and you've got to think about the big picture. There will be a reset. When you get a caution, everyone comes back to the leader, so there's no point to see a quick spin there coming out of turn four. Really slippery right there. It's the eight car there, driven by David Chang. Just got to be careful. Even when you get back on the racetrack, don't break a half shot by giving it too much welly here. Just try and ease back on the track. This is usually caused by jumping on the throttle a little too hard, which I think is exactly what's about to happen. Yep, breaks the rear end free when he got Ooh, on the Oh, he throttle. got tagged a little bit there oh, by the wheel and DP. Just barely got it. That's covered by a local yellow. He'll get that going, and that's no real big drama for anyone, but it's a wake-up call. And it's another element of the whole traffic situation. If you do have to go off for some reason, it can be tough to find a hole in the traffic to get back on. Well, there's sand. It, it's in Florida after a while. You know, you, you go off the racetrack, and there's sand, and some of those sand pits are deep, and you're not going to get out of there without a tow truck. Look at those carbon brakes on the prototype machines, how deep they can go in. The brake zones are really, really short. Talking to Mamo Rojas, who co-drives with Scott Pruitt, I said, what is the raceability? He said, it's tough. It's tough to pass because the brake zones are now so much shorter. The carbon brakes performance just minimizes when you have to get on the brake until the apex of the corner. Yes. Oh, this is not good. He could have high-sided himself here. That's the yeah. other thing I was going to say. You have to watch out for those curbs. If you get on that top of that curb with the chassis, it'll lift the wheels off the ground, and you will not be going anywhere. I suspect that's the case. Yeah, if he's stuck. So we have a local yellow right now. Turn marshals will call in. Let's see if he spins the rear wheels trying to get it back on. It'd be better to try to go back. Well, I was just thinking that. Reverse and take a good run at it. Well, one way or another, if he cannot move for whatever reason, I feel like he may see. have stalled the engine, Bob, because I don't see anything. Oh, there, there we go. He's fired it again now. Yep, he's stuck. Well, so much for reverse. Yeah, it's not even beginning to try to rock the front wheel. There's our full course. And here it comes, our first full course caution of the 12 hours. Field to be neutralized. We'll see who decides to take a pit stop. We're just getting started here at the 62nd running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. As you can see, a huge crowd on hand. They all have their favorites, if they're paying attention at all. Well, Sebring uh, is one of the toughest tracks there anywhere in the world. It's a challenging track. I mean, 17 corners, you really have to push yourself to run quickly there. It's a sprint race. It became a sprint race, uh, even so it's 12 hour, and it's a tough one. It's rough, it's bumpy, it's quick, it's uh, challenging. It's that kind of race that everybody wants to win because it's been going on for a very long time, and, uh, and it's a pretty mystic place. A mystic place. It's a great way to describe Sebring International Raceway. There you see the time of day on the Rolex clock at trackside. It will be open for 12 hours. A rum bump machine that just went through the Charlotte like Mystic Pizza. I mean, the color <laughs> scheme is something else. Somebody's bad dream. It's great, great to see team. those guys involved, though. Had yep. so much success in uh, Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Series. There you go. Last year's champions. I think there was more than rum involved in that paint job. <laughs> David Chang back on track. So we'll get reorganized and get ready for a green flag. This guy's going to be tough here today. Got a great driver lineup, the Plum Brothers, Madison Snow, great young talent, and Jan Halen. He's certainly shown his speed in Porsches over the last few years. Got Joe never, Vardy on the box. Yeah, He's you, one of the best strategy to say, guys, too. You can never count that car out. I mean, it, it might be long, you know, lounging around in the middle of the field from half the race, but toward the end, watch where it goes. 
What you're seeing here, wavering, everyone yeah. at home saying, why are these cars passing under caution? There's a procedure here. If you're trapped between your class leader and the pace car and the overall leader, you essentially get a wave by to get you back on the same lap as your class leader. So that will happen. It's very orchestrated. And uh, that communication is given by the race steward over the radio. That's a good thing, too, because it enables you to be able to get a lap back if you get in trouble for some reason, get split from your lead in your class. Well, we have a moment and we're under caution. Let's take the opportunity to explore the four classes involved in today's race, beginning with the prototype category, the fastest cars of all. Combining Grand Am Daytona prototypes, ALMS P2, and Delta Wing cars, the prototype class features the fastest and most technologically advanced cars in North America. The cars use red number panels, number plates, and leader lights. Among the many to watch, seven-time Rolex Sports Car Series champions, Chip Ganassi racing with Felix Sabatis, led by Scott Pruitt. Both the 01 and 02 had trouble in the Rolex 24 at Daytona, but the team is looking to bounce back with a strong finish here at Sebring. ALMS P1 champion Muscle Milk Picket Racing is fielding a Nissan-powered Orica for just the second race. The team is led by its two champion drivers, Klaus Graf and Lucas Lohr, who alone has won more races than anyone else in ALMS history. 2013 Grand Am DP driver champs Jordan Taylor and Max Angelelli and a normally aspirated Corvette DP are joined by Ricky Taylor. They finished second overall in the Rolex 24 and are looking to improve here in Sebring. Extreme Speed Motorsports uses Honda horsepower and features a strong driving team with Scott Sharp, Ryan Dial, and David Brabham leading their two-car assault. And Mazda bravely enters the prototype ranks this year with a pair of unique designs powered by its production-based Skyactiv clean diesel race engine, the only diesel-powered race car in the Tudor Championship. And don't forget your Rolex 24 winners, Action Express, Corvette driver Jao Barbosa, Christian Fittipaldi, and Sebastian Bourdais hope to start the season with two straight endurance wins. There's a look out the back of the little red Corvette, the beautiful C7 Stingray that is the pace car for this 12 hours of Sebring. With an added spoiler <laughs> for brand identification. Right. That little baby straight off the showroom floor could compete just about anywhere. Still over 25 minutes into this opening stint. Uh, the Daytona prototypes talking to the crews, as much information as they'll give you, say they'll go about 43 to 46 minutes on fuel, so they're about halfway through that fuel load. So be interesting to see who stays out, maybe trying to gain some track position early in the go and get a little bit off schedule with the rest of the groups. It's always nice to get a look at the tires and everything, and if you need to make any adjustments on board there with uh, Westy, Richard Westbrook. Look at him bounce around, they're not even at speed. I mean, just, just driving around here pummels you. Westbrook won here last year, driving as the third driver in the Corvette squad. He'll drive a Corvette at Le Mans this year, but full-time in the prototypes. Time now to open the pit lane for service, if you want it. We begin with the prototypes, who have their own lap to pit. The GT cars will have their own lap to follow. On board with Oz Negri. Brazilian by birth, Oz is going to go back and race in the most popular form of motorsports in his native country, stock car racing. And I was amazed to find out it'll be the first time in 23 years that Oz has raced back in Brazil. That's going to be really cool. He's very excited about that and uh, just had a few problems over the course this weekend. It's been a rough road for Mike Shank and the boys, but they really grind hard. They're digging deep and they're going to come good here. I know at this season, I think they're going to climb the winner's roster before this season is out. It's going to be prototypes and LMPC cars allowed in on this pit stop sequence. The reason they do that is just with so many cars, it just enables the teams to operate and not be in such tight confines that any problems may occur. It keeps the flow going. This is on board those seven Mazda Skyactiv diesel we talked about before. We expect to see everybody come in and take advantage of this service. Uh, the only downside to doing this, of course, is it makes the yellow flag caution laps uh, very long because it's uh, 3.7 miles around this racetrack, and that's got to happen three times to get everybody accommodated. See cars weaving around. I'd suggest that maybe they're some of the cars that may not be coming in. Even so, if they come in, they may decide to keep on that same rubber, so you just want to keep those marbles around the edge of the racetrack 
particularly driving slowly, you will pick up little balls of rubber, and when you try and get back up to speed, the grip level is not there. So it's important, whatever you're doing, try and keep those tires cleaned. Look at that lineup of cars. Everybody bright and shiny. It won't look like that a little over 11 hours from now. And here they come, halfway through a fuel load. So this will be a quickie. Should only be about 12 to 15 seconds of fuel. And if you're going to put tires on, that's going to cost you some time. You can't get a tire change done in that amount of time without it being absolutely perfect. So maybe just top them up with fuel and send them again. Let's see if anyone changes that strategy. Scott Pruitt and Scott Dixon coming to stop in pit lane here. Going to be fuel and tires, four Continental tires for both cars. Checked in with both teams. Don't anticipate any chassis changes on this stop. When we look at these cars back at Daytona, they were running low downforce. Here at Sebring, they're high downforce configuration. So you, when you look at these Fords, you see these four big dive planes on the front. Talking to these teams, they say the drivers really have to take care of those dive planes. Very easy to lose those if they get into some traffic. Andrew? I've got both action express cars here. The action express the roar of the Chevy V8 is the uh, theme car going out. Uh, and out the uh, second of the action express as well. They didn't take any tires, they just topped up with fuel. And uh, yes, some drink went into Yal Barbosa as well. He just took a quick sip of the, the drink bottle. And I think I just threw out the corner of my eye that action express was uh, actually beaten away by one of the LMP2 cars. Well, you could see there with the Chip Ganassi cars, they had a problem, not a problem, but uh, by changing all four tires, the refueling, because it wasn't a full fuel, it was done way earlier, so there is a slight delay there. And Andrew Davis trying to get the Dempsey Racing Porsche back up to speed. Yeah, he had a problem out on the course. I don't know if the car shut off and he's recycled or gone to a B ignition, but in any event, he's got it back going. He'll be sharing that car with Joe Foster, Norbert Seidler, terrific sports car driver from Austria, and Patrick Dempsey, the team co-owner, and you all know who he is. On this next lap, it'll be GTLM and GTD will be making their pit stops. Next up for pit stop service will be the GT class. Let's take a closer look at what the GTLM category is all about. The ALMS GT division, recognized as the best GT competition in the world, continues this year as the GT Le Mans class. A true proving ground for leading manufacturers, GTLM features open competition among tire manufacturers. All cars bear red number panels, number plates, and leader lights. Corvette Racing, which won the ALMS GT team and driver championships last year with Jan Magnussen and Antonio Garcia, returned to Sebring where they'll try for their ninth class win since 2002. Last year, SRT Viper finished fifth here at Sebring. This year, they look to build on a third place finish at the Rolex 24. BMW Team RLL, co-owned by Bobby Rahal, David Letterman, and Mike Lanigan, started strong in Daytona with two cars in the GT Top 5. Aston Martin and Ferrari are also in this category, but watch out for Rolex 24 class winners Porsche North America to once again be strong here at Sebring. Still waiting for the GT field to make its way around as you take a look at one of those beautiful Corvettes. Yeah, did you see the three nose has got some damage, guys? He's been in the back of somebody. It's nothing much superficial at the grill area. See it right there? Oh, yeah. It's crunched, it's the, nose crunched a little bit. the nose down somewhat. Hmm. You know, when they were lined up and coming around before the pits opened the first time, I saw little puffs of tire smoke here and there lock up from some of the cars who perhaps close the gap quicker than they anticipated. I wonder if anybody got into anybody during that lineup. It's easy to have happen. I remember York Bergmaster had major damage here at Sebring on that warm-up lap uh, a few years ago with the Porsche, and uh, you suddenly get that stack-up effect. You're not expecting the guy in front of you to try, suddenly try and get heat into the brakes, and uh, he jumps on the brake pedal. You have relatively cold tires, and you can't stop. So it's a dangerous part of the, ra the race, even before you've seen the green flag. Let's see what the Corvette team chooses to do for Antonio Garcia when he reaches the pit. 60 kilometers an hour is the pit lane speed, about 37 miles per hour. And uh, if you come down pit road versus staying out on the racetrack under green conditions, about a 36 second loss plus the service. 
Colin Gavin in the four, Antonio Garcia in the three. I just checked in with Danny Binks, crew chief on the three car. He said this nose pretty smashed up, so they're going to take a look at it, see if they have to repair this. I talked to Danny Binks before the race. He said, this is a race where we're going to have to be perfect. So this first hour of the race, not going the way that they wanted. Andrew? Well, both the Porsche North America entries are in, and they are putting new Michelins on. Remember, most of the uh, competitors here are running on the Continental tyres, but well, they decided actually not to take the uh, tyres that were out there, but they didn't take them. So uh, they're both back on the race track, uh, just in front of the uh, Corvettes, I see. Like the it's like the 56 car leapfrogged around some of those other competitors, so it looks like they did not take tyres possibly in the Ray Hall camp. Well, maybe two. Two is always an option as well. It's a little bit difficult to drive until you get the other half of yeah, the car literally sure. up to 10, but uh, warm day here. It shouldn't be too much of an issue. And back up to speed they come. We anticipate a green flag, so we'll take a quick break and return to one of the great racing events in all the world, the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, presented by Fresh from Florida here on Fox Sports One. Back live to drama here at Sebring International Raceway. That's the number 33 GTD class Viper, driven by Ben Keating, which exploded in flames while going through turn six, Gurney Bend. This is either a fuel fire or an oil fire. It's being fed, so I'm suspecting it might be a fuel fire at this point. Just been into the pit lane, all of the field, or most of them had come down pit road to uh, get some refueling done. So it's stopping here. Okay, so okay. see, he's, he's lost a fuel line or something. Yeah, something stopped. broke. I wonder if he just, whether it's stopped and then he refired it. And then you, you can see it's been leaking something because the fire goes back to where the car is. I mean, you've either got a massive fuel leak or you've got an oil. I'm suspecting it's probably going to be a fuel leak just because the way it keeps reigniting. Usually by the time you get an oil fire knocked down, it stays down. But I wouldn't be surprised for them to stop the field because I think it's getting to a dangerous point. That fire yeah. is licking across the racetrack and even cars driving by. Well, what, what happens, Cal, is the next thing that's going to happen is one of the tire, rear tires are going to melt. When it does, it's going to explode and blow the bodywork everywhere. I've had a car, I've lost a car like this, one of the Roush cars. You see him putting water on the tire, on the back tire, that's a smart thing to do, too. Yeah. You're trying to keep that from exploding. That just adds more oxygen all at once and it uh, blows things to bits. This all began about 35 minutes into the race. Let's hear from the team manager with Andrew. Yeah, it's Greg Jones here. Greg, uh, this is devastating for you. Do you know what happened? Well, no, we actually don't. There was a bad vibration uh, right when he left pit road and, uh, you know, he couldn't start the car and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, he radios in that he's on fire and you can see what happened here. So, unfortunately, it's a bad day for the Viper Exchange. Uh, Viper, so it's about all we can do. This car was looking so competitive in GTD. Yeah, we were uh, we were having a good weekend, so right where we needed to be, Ben was doing a great job. Uh, you know, all of our drivers uh, had time in the car, and we were really looking forward to a good race. Unfortunately, it uh, doesn't look like we're going to have that now. I feel for you. Early bath. Thank you very much. Boy, that thing just keeps reigniting underneath the middle of the car. They knock it down, and it, it's feeding itself. Wondering if the fuel pump's still on. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, is it wasn't shut off before a Ben Keating climbed from the cockpit. This was a real favorite to take honors here. I mean, it's early days for that Viper in terms of the durability, but in terms of speed, everyone said at the test here last month, boy, that Viper put together some really strong segment times and was going to be competitive this weekend. Ben Keating sharing with the Dutch Blickemolen brothers. Very quick, very experienced. As Calvin mentioned, a competitive team. There's the reaction from the pit. Tough race, and we're just getting started here at the 12 Hours of Sebring. Stand by, we'll be back. There's a difference. Something that separates first place from second and pushes some to excellence over and over. What compels this hunger, this need to be the best? For most, winning is all there is. For a few, competition serves a deeper purpose. What began over 60 years ago has become an obsession. Because after the fight and the thrill of the hunt, there's much to be learned. Winning more auto races than any other company in history didn't come easy. 
But it's not an accident. It's a testament. A testament to a lifelong commitment to automotive perfection. Decade after decade, we've combined passion and discipline in a relentless quest to never settle and never rest on our laurels. Here's to excellence. The name synonymous with endurance racing around the world, Porsche. They've certainly had their own chapter here at Sebring International Raceway. As you can see, the battle against that burning number 333 Viper continues. On board with Patrick Long, one of the factory 911 RSRs. The first Porsche factory racing team dedicated to North American sports car racing. Now there's the number three Corvette. We saw earlier that it had crunched the nose. Now it's in for more extensive repair. Chris Neville. Yeah, Bob, Antonio Garcia has been sitting here for about two and a half minutes. Hasn't gone down a lap, but the team trying to take advantage of this extended caution to get this car fixed up. The nose looked pretty bad on the three car, but I didn't think they needed to bring it in just because of the nose. But talking to Dan Binks, the crew chief on this car, his biggest concern was because of that hit on the nose, the left front fender was shoved back in front of the driver's side door. So he was very concerned that driver changes were going to be difficult. So when they saw the fire with the Viper, they decided at this point in time, great time to get this car fixed up and hopefully not go down a lap. Well, last year they won the class, not this car, but uh, the four car, and they did it from two laps down. So you can rebound. Certainly with these safety car procedures, you can get away by get that lap back. And I think they're making the right choice, Dorsey. Some of that ducting could have been messed up in terms of the brakes and uh, the radiator and stuff. So I think this is the right call, even though it is painful. Dan Binks is one of the best. I mean, what he looked at right there was not just the integrity of the car, but he realized there was going to be a trouble. Every time they did a driver change, that door was going to come into play. And nothing's fitting quite exactly the way it should. So don't do this to your Corvette at home. But it's I always mean, interesting. They are to remarkable how good they do on this car. They to watch how the cars come apart and go back together, because certainly that's a part of the design. Yes. Mission statement is to make a car that's easily fixable when yeah. things go wrong, because they will. They were close. You could see the work was pretty much complete. Now they'll probably spend a bit more time making sure everything is absolutely buttoned up. But if they would have been in a position to, they'd probably send him with a bit more work to be done to stay on that lead lap, get him back in and finish it off. But. Uh, the pace car was already there, so they could, didn't have the option. This Corvette team, many time champions here at Sebring when it was a part of the American Le Mans series. Of course, that means when you're building your car during the off season, you had all the way to mid March to be ready to go racing. But now as a part of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship, their first event was the Rolex 24 at Daytona back at the end of January. That shortens up the old timeline. It really does. It really puts an enormous amount of pressure on the teams to be ready to go. And uh, as we saw at Daytona, some of the teams were not ready. It was too early in their development process. Looks like they finally won the war with the fire. They've got though. You see they have the soapy sudsy stuff out there now that finally took it down. But the car appears to be a complete casualty. Here's how it began. Hopefully it is finally over and we can get back to green flag action here at Sebring. Driver Ben Keating climbed out okay. The car, not so much. Welcome back to Sebring International Raceway. Coming up on 50 minutes into the 12 hours of Sebring here on Fox Sports. The fire has been put out in the Viper. The car has been pushed off the racetrack. Track repair is continuing. While we have a moment, let's get caught up on all of the happenings since the season opening Rolex 24 at Daytona. We call it our Mazda News and Notes. And it begins with equalizing performance among the various mechanical combinations on track. Yeah, absolutely. Both uh, different configurations of prototype cars have been given much more downforce. The P2 car, like you're looking at right there, can now run in the high downforce package versus the Le Mans package. So the Daytona prototypes had that big red diffuser, those big dive planes, which are obvious to other people looking on screen. Green and a uh, few other changes. The Ford has been given a bit more power, a bit more boost, and the Chevy's been throttled back a little bit. Just trying to create an even playing field moving forward. There have also been some personnel changes. The very successful team manager at Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis, Tim Keane, parted ways with the team after the Rolex 24. And for Wayne Taylor's organization, Simon Hodgson has also left the group, and uh, these are two great friends of us at Fox Sports One. We uh, don't like not having you here in the paddock this weekend, boys. So get back. And uh, these are two of the best in the business. I don't think they're going to be out of action very long. You have to suspect that they will be picked up fairly quickly. 
And the need for that performance balancing, in case you're wondering, is because of the diversity. When you have four, six, eight, 10, and 12 cylinder engines, turbo normally aspirated, diesel and gas, takes a lot of equalizing. Let's go to Chris Neville. Well, the three cars back on track, one lap down, pretty much changed all the body work forward of the doors. And Danny, you guys have come from behind many times. I know you're a little bit frustrated, but you guys have come from behind before. How is the three car? Well, right now, I think we're pretty good. I tore off that nose really bad. That thing was rubbing on the tires, and we got that yellow. Uh, we practiced that stuff at the shop. You know, if the hood wasn't bent up so bad, we would have been able to do it in one lap, and that's what we had been practicing. So uh, these guys are awesome, man. Everybody works so hard. You know, I don't think anybody here could change all of that body work in three and a half minutes. So we're ready to go. Any idea what happened there? No, I think it's just everybody was bumping and grinding at the beginning, and we got the worst end of it. Uh, we see a couple drivers standing here in the background. We got Tommy Milner over here. Tommy, you've been wa able to watch the first hour of this race, seeing everything kind of transpire down here uh, at Corvette Racing. What are your thoughts of this uh, first hour of racing? Yeah, I mean, kind of what I expected. Uh, the, the class is pretty close right now. All, all the cars are pretty even. Um, Oliver had a great start there, got by the two BMWs and uh, chasing down the Porsche there. So, you know, just a good indication that, that our car is pretty quick so far and uh, just got to focus on the race and not make mistakes. You see the three car having a little bit of trouble here. How does the team stay up? Yeah, I mean, for them at least, it's, it's early on, so that they they can get that out of the way now, and then they and they get, kind of get their lap back and keep racing. Um, but you know, stuff like that. You know, for us, you know, we see that, and we know that that those kind of things, you know, hamper our race. So just got to keep our nose clean and get to the end with a, with a car that's in, in one piece, and then the last hour go racing. Indeed, very early on, Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm down here with the team manager of the car that's leading the race, mate. The Delta Wing, Dave Price. Bit of clever strategy, I think, Dave. Well, I don't need to stop so often as the rest of the field, so we're just making the most of where we are on fuel. Now, of course, a year ago, you made the debut with the new configuration Delta Wing with the, with the Mazda and Elite engine, uh, Elan engine, I should say, and um, that was a hard old trial, that race to here 12 months ago, but going much better now. Yeah, we've done a lot of work in the year, and, and of course, we built a new coupe as well, and um, yeah, I'm hoping we'll have a good, reliable run. I mean, this time last year, that was us on fire. Now, do you think that this race is going to come to you a bit then because of that fuel situation? Well, I mean, on track when we can't compete on speed, but, you know, our fuel situation is our biggest bonus, to be honest. Well, great. Andy Merrick doing a great job. And just to remind everybody how bloody narrow, how narrow these tyres are at the very front. Look at it. It's only about three inches across. <laughs> amazing just amazing technology and uh, he says they're good on fuel but their fuel tank capacity is way less about 65 percent the size of the prototype machines but it's all about the fact that concept is all about half the horsepower dorsey but half the drag and uh, drag means you're dragging that machine through the air and that burns fuel and there's virtually no weight on those front tires anyway you can go up there in front of that car and any one of us pick it up off the ground it's uh, there's nothing up there it is quite an engineering achievement. Andy Mayrick will be sharing with Catherine Legg and young Colombian driver Gabby Chavez during this Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. Another break coming up. Hopefully, a green flag on the other side. Don't go away. Success in racing can often be judged on the strength of your collaborations. Here at Corvette Racing, of course, it's their technical partnership with Mobile One Lubricants that is without equal. Why, you say? It's only oil. Oh, no, it's so much more than that. On a continual basis, the Mobile One and Corvette engineers work together to enhance performance, durability, heat tolerances. And of course, that extends from the engine to the transmission to the power steering fluid. What does that mean for me, you may say? well. Quite a lot, actually. While this is a world-class top sports car, many of the same lubricants also appear on the cars that we drive on the road. Thanks very much, Justin. You may have noticed the space housing Justin's report. <laughs> there it is. We got to come up with a name for this. It looks like, you know, the the intake manifold of it a does actually C7 Stingray, but we can do better than that. What are those little? Bouncy inflatables that the Bounce kids house. have somewhere. Bounce yeah. houses. Put some kids up on top of there. <laughs> or the, the bow tie dome. What happened was paddock space for all the teams to work on their cars has shrunk for this year's event. So some teams just went with the traditional awnings, not Corvette. This thing folds up into about 300 pounds of canvas, and in two hours, they can inflate it. And when I asked the team manager, Doug Feehan, what kind of weather it will withstand, he said, if you get a wind strong enough to blow this thing away, 
it blowing away is the least of your problems. <laughs> That's what they said at Homestead. It's amazing. It's cool. And there's no tent poles or anything. It's just no, a that's wide open neat. space. It's really and usable that's the space. beauty of it. Right. No uh, tent poles down the middle. Let's go to Chris Neville. Well, Bob, Jim Farley, Executive VP Marketing, Sales, and Service for Ford down here in the Ganassi area overseeing all the activity with this group. And, uh, Jim, you're not just a guy at the corporate office. You're also a racer yourself. In fact, I think we spoke with you back at Monterey Historics last year when you were racing your Cobra. But what do you think here at Sebring, Ford EcoBoost? Yeah, it's so great to have Ford back doing this as part of our DNA to race. And uh, I was talking to uh, Scott Pruitt. He said, I haven't been here since the late 80s. So it's about time we came back. It feels great to be here. Yeah, and from really what I'm hearing, this is really the tip of the ice iceberg for Ford. This is not just going to be prototypes. We're going to see you guys in some other stuff, too. Well, I wish I could break some news today, but I won't. But, you know, this is, as I said, racing is part of the DNA of our company. and. Raj, myself, the whole management team really believe in investing in racing and it helps sell street cars like our ST, our new Mustang, and Need for Speed this weekend, so it's all good and thanks for Fox Sports for covering it. Well, hopefully we see the Blue Oval in Victory Lane later today. Jim Farley, a great guy, drives his uh, Cobra. He's got a beautiful Cobra. You should see this thing. Yes, he does. He races with us over at HSR and uh, he's got a couple cars. He's a real enthusiast i mean he's, he's the real deal yep. they got the right guy for the job yeah you had to sit him down yet do us not yet i'm hoping yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm gonna make a deal with him i'm <laughs> thinking his cobra is a 427 big block i'm yeah I it's a beautiful right car that. absolutely yeah. beautiful restoration on that car there's the o2 from chip ganassi racing with felix sabatis originally meant as a north american endurance cup entrant only due to the presence not least uh, of which of guys like scott dixon who have IndyCar responsibilities coming up, as you see the the 33 or to combat. That is the very worst looking thing you can have. I, I Like I said before, I had this happen to me in my racing career. That is a nasty job now for the guys back in the shop to dismantle, and there's really not a lot you can do. Mm. It was a one of one car, if I'm not mistaken, from yeah, Riley. You can't use much of anything when it's gotten that hot. You know, inside there, the gearbox has been hot now, the engine, there's you know, there's so many composite pieces to these cars nowadays to keep the light weight of it. Uh, and all of that stuff is hugely flammable. It doesn't take much. If there's any good news is that the next round of the championship at Long Beach is uh, not going to have GTD category racing there. Right. So they have to Mazda Raceway Laguna Sacra in May. But uh, still a lot of work to be done to get that car rebuilt. Well, while we're on the subject of the GT Daytona category, let's take a little closer look at the makeup of the class. Made up primarily of cars from the Grand Am GT, GX, and ALMS GTC classes, GT Daytona machines are enhanced but not defined by technology. Like their PC counterparts, all GTD class cars utilize blue number panels, rear end plates, and all are on Continental tires. Those competing in this huge class, last year's ALMS GTC driver champions, Jerome Bleekemolen and Cooper McNeil as well as Grand Am GT champ Alessandro Balzan and his number 63 Scuderia Corsa Ferrari 458. Almost half of the teams in this category race Porsches, but in the Rolex 24, it was the Audi and the Ferrari battling to the end in a dramatic finish that ended up with the Ferrari on top. Well, let's pick up the GTD class leader. There it is, the Porsche number 30 in Momo colors. Making their way around as we await the green flag. On board with Kuba Gomirziak. I had a chat with the Polish driver recently. And it's uh, it's great to see a young driver like him with a really, and I mean over the top enthusiasm for the new Tudor United Sports Car Championship. And as the field begins to form up again, there's one of the GTLM class Vipers. It's the number 93 car. Dominic Farnbacher drives the sister car, the 91. He right now is with Andrew Marriott. Yeah, and he's one of the real fun characters in the paddock here. Dominic, kind of frustrating. This race hasn't really got underway, has it? No, not really. I mean, after the incident we saw earlier with the fire, I mean, we're lucky that Ben got out of the car. We don't know yet what happened there. Uh, or maybe a fuel line broke or something, but other than that, uh, the, it's, the, the race is not even didn't even start yet and uh, we already had a strategy like that in our team so you've got a strong car here haven't you 
Yeah, we we have a, a good lineup here. Uh, two cars left, our GTLM cars. Um, and we're trying our best. Right now, uh, Kuno is leading the field. Uh, Mark is on 10th place, so we have uh, both options. Either we run strong or not, uh, we will see in the future. Now, Dominic was telling me a couple of days ago that he's a bit of an ace around the old uh, Nürburgring Nordschleife. You're going for a bit of a record soon, aren't you? You're going to try and be the fastest street car, is it, ever around the track? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what we are looking for. I mean, uh, some other brand beat our, our old record, so I think in the future we are I think uh, there's a plan maybe to go back to the Nürburgring and beat that record. Yeah, of course, uh, way back when, uh, what was the forerunner of this uh, championship? You used to race there, you know, with the great Porsche 956s and before that the 917s, of course. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great racetrack and uh, I compare it a little bit with uh, with these American racetracks like a Road America, a Road Atlanta, Sebring a little bit with a bumpy course. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite similar and I really like that. Great to see your enthusiasm for the Nürburgring now to Chris Neville. Well, down at the Mazda camp, two of the prettiest cars on the racetrack, and John Doonan overseeing this program. And John, you guys are really learning a lot about these cars, finally starting to get into the performance of the car. Well, the Mazda brand doesn't stop uh, challenging ourselves to develop, and came here for a couple test days after Daytona, learned a ton, and made up almost half that gap we had at Daytona. Uh, still using a ton of the stock components from the Skyactiv uh, diesel engine. Uh, we're proud of that, but at some point as racers, we like to fight for the win. So each of these weekends, each of the laps, we're learning more. And uh, come a few races here, we're going to be in the fight. With this diesel technology, what were some of the big challenges at Daytona? Certainly, again, using stock components and putting them through the most rugged test, asking them to do four or five times what they're designed to do uh, on the racetrack. A great test bed, but uh, very difficult to make them uh, compete at the top of the level uh, of the class and the prototypes. Well, as we've seen in GT, we know that Mazda, John Dune, and everybody here from Speed Source will get these cars up to the front. Thank you, Chris. Big supporters of rising young drivers as well as technologies and motorsports, both on the racetrack and off. Another break coming up. Nearly an hour under the yellow flag. Everybody ready to go back to racing. Back at Sebring International Raceway in the 62nd running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. I'm Bob Varsha with Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, down in the pit lane, Andrew Marriott, and Chris Neville. Field forming up in about a lap and a half. We expect to go green once again. While we have time, let's have a look at the fourth and final class in competition among our Field of 64 Prototype Challenge. A class retained from the ALMS is Prototype Challenge, a spec class featuring open cockpit race cars and technologies such as carbon fiber chassis, carbon brakes, and a sequential gearbox. All PC cars utilize blue number panels, rear end plates, and all run on Continental tires. Those competing include 2013 driver champion Mike Wash and 2013 team champs Core Autosport with drivers John Bennett, Colin Brown and James Gouet. In Daytona is Core Autosport taking the win, but here in Sebring it seems to be anyone's game. Back to live pictures. Coming down from the scene of the fire that brought out the yellow flag that has now reached over 50 minutes in length but it looks like things are cleaning up quickly. This is turn six, Gurney Bend, of the 17 corners on this track. Eight bear the names of some of the legends who raced here. The Fangio Chicane, the Cunningham Corner, the Collier Curve, the Jean de Bien Bend. There are still a few that could use the name of another racing legend. To Chris Neville. Well, Ryan DL tasted champagne here back in 2012, and Ryan, back at Daytona, we were blending these two series, Daytona Prototype, P2 cars together, and really the long straights there really lended themselves to the Daytona Prototypes, but here, a little bit different story. What are you seeing in this first hour? Yeah, I mean, I think our pace at Daytona was actually pretty good. We just obviously had some uh, mechanical issues, but uh, we felt going into the race, we were strong, uh, and then coming here, we definitely felt that we would be on a little bit more of an even playing field. Uh, obviously, there's been a couple of changes on the rules, um, but it's definitely benefiting us. Uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, not just us, but the old car and the muscle mill car being competitive. And, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see a dominant car, but it's nice to see cars running equal lap times and doing it in very different ways. But 
You know, for us, obviously, we're the, the title sponsors with uh, Tequila Patron for the North American Endurance Cup. So we're we're trying hard to kind of get ourselves back on track here and uh, keep all the sponsors happy. But so far, it's been a great weekend. You know, it's a hard race to win. Um, I enjoyed winning a couple of years ago and, and the HPD, actually. So hopefully we can win it again today. You know, one thing we heard at Daytona is it takes a little bit longer for the P2 cars because they're lighter for the tire temps and tire pressures to come up. We see that this weekend, too. Definitely not anywhere near as bad. I mean, the the road course tire, which is what this is, and also the road course aero that we get to run now makes a big difference for us. I think a combination of the, the hard oval tire with the Le Mans aero kit uh, and also cold temperatures at Daytona was, was not great for us. Uh, but here, you know, it would be nice if we did have a difference with the rules so that, you know, you could gamble on not doing tires and, and get an advantage on it. Because I definitely think one of the strengths, especially with our car, is tire wear. But... Um, Hey, so far we're out front and we're, we're happy about that and uh, also a good friend, Ben King, so I'm glad to see uh, he's out there and bumped for the Viper guys. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. It's a home game for Ryan Dial, who lives in Orlando, about an hour, hour and a half drive from Sebring International Raceway. The town of Sebring has a population between 15 and 20,000, I would guess, five times that many people have rushed to Sebring International this weekend for the 62nd running of this great race. To Ryan DL's team manager, Robin Hill, this morning about their progress this weekend. He said, we had a really good test here, but he said, we came back and we suddenly lost the balance on the race car. And that's been a common thread up and down pit lane this weekend when you talk to the teams. This racetrack changes so much, Dorsey, day to day, session to session, and particularly month to month. There's a lot of IndyCar testing that actually occurs here at Sebring, particularly over on the other half of the circuit. Puts a lot of rubber down, changes the grip level. Teams set the car up, come back, and they're kind of lost. You really have to be flexible don't get locked into that setup you've got to chase the racetrack a little bit yeah it's been that way at Sebring for the longest time you know during the daytime in the morning it's usually really quick and then come afternoon sunlight you lose all the grip and then if you start chasing the car then the next morning you've got it all wrong again GT Daytona leader Kerber Gamerziak in that Porsche late splash looks like it's going to take four continental tires as well that's a smart call right now they just ran an hour behind the pace car so um Get those tires on there in case the other one's picked up debris or anything because we've been slow behind that pace car. I think they're walking a strategy there that they still had plenty of fuel on board they could afford to go, but this yellow has been so long. Yeah. They're kind of running out of fuel, and uh, if we go back to green, they'd be in shortly thereafter, so it doesn't make sense to stay out. I'd like as a team manager to you know pull those tires off and put fresh ones on because of just what we've seen, you know. So much uh, behind the pace car stuff, picking up debris, and you know, that all that uh, fire and fire dust and all that stuff that was out there. A big part of the 60 second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring has been spent under the yellow flag. Nearly an hour from right now, an hour ago, this happened as Ben Keating brought his GTD class Viper to the side of the track in turn six with a massive fire that took fire crews a long time to extinguish, as you saw, Keating got out of the car. He was okay. Under the caution for nearly one hour, we now expect the green flag to get back to racing. And now we're seeing all of these cars trying to, you know, get a bit of brake uh, temperature into the wheels, which will then get some tire temperature as well, cleaning off those tires if they've picked up any of those marbles. And that's the danger time. You can really run into the back of someone very easily, so you've got to be careful under these conditions. Those firefighters, firefighters fought that for such a long time and uh, really did a good job of getting it all under contained, you know, with it was a fuel fed fire, so it was really uh, not an easy situation. The Corvette Stingray pace car begins to pull away just that little bit, and there's the Delta Wing, that unique vehicle maximizing weight, horsepower, fuel use for efficiency while keeping speed. Getting ready to go racing at Sebring once again after nearly an hour under the yellow flag. A yellow flag brought out by this horrendous fire under the number 33 GT Daytona class Viper of Ben Keating who climbed out of the car, but it took the crews a long time to get it put out. It looked like he reached in perhaps to shut off the electrics on the car which would stop the fuel pump. But as Dorsey Schrader pointed out earlier, something apparently broke under the car and fuel or oil kept feeding that fire. 
until it was finally knocked down and the racetrack prepared in turn six. We talked about a vibration after they got the pit stop done, like something was uh, a tire or something might have come apart and tore a fuel line off. But for sure, that was a fuel fire. And um, it's just a shame to lose a race car like that. Luckily, Mr. Keating is fine. There's the Delta Wing leading the way in the hands of Andy Merrick. And at long last, we are ready to go back to green flag racing here. Now they can't, they can't pass him to start finish line. I was about to say, some of these guys might want to pounce on that car. Yeah, green, green flag, flag ways, then you can go, but you've got to wait for the green. you got different classes right at the front. There's Bruno Schoenkir in that blue open cockpit prototype. That's an LMPC car. So we see the Action Express car get around Sharpie. This will be Bob good. Look at this. on the move. It's a log jam Whoa. down into turns two and three. It gets really tight here. Three wide through turn three there. You don't see that often. Lucas Lur there forces the muscle milk entry inside of Scott Sharp. Remember, Scott Sharp didn't change tires. Maybe he's struggling here to find grip. That's the scene of the incident. See the oil dry or the dust. We're going to see that for a few laps. The battle on the brakes down into the hairpin. Ricky Taylor looks to the outside, side by side here, coming off the hairpin. Great stuff. And right now it appears there's no catching Andy Mayrick in that delta wing. Boy, he's got, got it going, doesn't he? Yes, oh, he does. Very speed. impressive at Daytona. Had decent speed here. This isn't probably the best configuration of racetrack to take advantage of that low drag machine like Daytona and the high speed nature of that circuit. Official numbers on the caution flag. 15 laps of caution, 59 total minutes under yellow. Lucas Lur pushing hard in the muscle milk entry. He's up to third now. Chasing Joao Barbosa. He's won here at Sebring in class five times, looking for that overall win. So here's a good example of what the Tudor United Sports Car Championship Friday, is all awesome about. Job. Hang with that five car. Delta Wing still ahead. Delta Wing leading the former Daytona prototypes, leading the former LMP2 car. An LMPC car in close attendance. I bet this little Delta Wing is getting a cheer from the massive crowd gathered here at Sebring. That's one of those you love it or you hate it cars, you know, and for the fans that like the way that looks out there, they will be going crazy. So unique that we see the Mike Shank racing entry, the need for speed. Ford Riley, the movie opened last night. They'd love to celebrate that with a win here today. Saw that uh, car in the movie at the Detroit Auto Show while I was up there. Shelby GT, nice car. Riding with one of the best. Scott Pruitt just never seems to lose a step as he moves from race victory to series championship. One of the truly glittering resumes among active drivers in American motorsports. A little defensive posture there by the Corvette. Yeah, Bert Frizzell behind the wheel of the second of the Action Express racing entries made his intentions known. Don't think about the inside lane. <laughs> Now, this is the part of the racetrack I was talking about or trying to at the top of the show. Those concrete oh blocks were there on New Year's Eve in 1950. Look at this. Look at that yellow Corvette. That's a GTLM machine, which will have more speed, but he's just trapped in amongst the GTT, GTD category right now. Got to be careful. Got to be patient. Remember, that three car is trying to come from behind. Don't cause more damage to the race car. I was here when they removed some of those concrete um, blocks, if you will to make the racetrack on the backside more like a real racetrack. And those things are over two feet thick per, per chunk. Just a tremendous amount of concrete around this place. Look how close these classes are. A lot yeah. of the GTLM drivers say, we can't compete with these GTD machines on the straightaways. The reason being is the GTD car doesn't have all of the high downforce body work, which slows you down. Yes, it gives you grip, but uh, causes drag down the straightaway. Look at this action, the 30 car. Oh, he oh. got turned. No damage there if he doesn't get stuck in that, in that sand. GB Autosport Tully's racing entry here. Took down some sponsorship signs, though. You might have to pay for that. Nope, he's good. He's going to get going. Local yellow only, and they'll take that away. Mike Avenatti behind the wheel. GB stands for Global Baristas. Nice marketing touch. Last thing Here's on his mind right now. Clean him up. And there now the Delta Wing has been caught and is being passed. Yeah, they pounced on him. I figured they would sooner or later. 
Tell you what, Ricky Taylor is looking strong here in this uh, opening couple of hours, showing a lot of pace, qualified very well yesterday. And this is a team that struggled at the test. They couldn't keep the car on the ground, just over the bumps, really struggled with their shock package, but they've gone away, done some work, and the car is much improved, looking competitive here this weekend. Here's that spin from below, kind of a not nudge here, I think. Yeah, the road was oh. just taken away from him. Yeah, he kind of got wow. pushed off there. I don't know if they ever actually touched or not, but just didn't yeah. have any road there. It's a difficult place to hang as a driver attempting an overtake. It's a tricky corner, believe it or not. You're going into 10 and you're coming off of that S turn, and the car's not really flat yet. You've got to try to be cognizant of getting the, the chassis back to square before you get hard on the brakes. <laughs> Look at Oz Negri. He is looking really racy, boys. Putting the pressure on Ricky Taylor right now. Started 61st, now up in the top six. No traffic to deal with right now for Oz Negri. Darren Law. Hey guys, we've been talking about all the traffic and all the different classes and how do you keep track of all that? Well, here is a modern piece of technology. This is telemetry supplied by IMSA. And if you look at the screen, it's a track map. You've got different color-coded dots for each class. Red being prototype, blue being one other, green being another, yellow being another. This is how the strategists keep track of where their cars are, where the leader of the, tra of the race is, and where the leader of their class is. And you can see by this, it's almost like a bunch of marching ants around the screen. It takes a lot of uh, a lot of following to be able to keep track of all this stuff. Problems on track for the number 44 of John Potter and Magnus Racing. They had a difficult Rolex 24 at Daytona, finishing 12th in class. Oh, he with gets lots oh, of man, issues. He got collected. Yeah, he had nothing to do with that. He got a nudge. I think that's turn 13, and that is one of those areas of the racetrack. If the car in front of you breaks a little bit harder, you're kind of committed, Dorsey, and there's nothing you can do. We saw it last year with some of the different categories racing together over in turn 13. Problem here, left yeah, front left down. Front. Yeah, I was going to say, when you see a car go straight like that, there's an indication either something broke it. Uh, luckily, it did it in turn 17 right before Pitt Lynn, so it's not going to cost him that badly. The Keen and the WeatherTech Porsche. Alex Job Racing celebrating 25 years of racing here at Sebring with nine class titles. Looking for a tenth. They've got some work to do. Just be a left front only. They're going to put more on there. Uh, sometimes these wheels can be hard to get off when the tire's been mangled. With these wheel guns, they typically got a different torque rating. Putting the wheel on is taking it off. So like maybe 40% power putting it on, 60% taking it off. Chris? Well, Bob, right here next to the 22 is trying to look for some contact or something along the left side of the 22 WeatherTech Porsche, but doesn't look like any marks from contact other than just that Continental tire flopping around. So not sure what happened here to cause the left front to uh, sleep. Well, as the car goes by, if you get a chance, let's have a look at the left rear bumper where you see the unmistakable profile of Ralphie the Buffalo, symbol of the University of Colorado, where Cooper McNeil is a junior this year. Go Buffs. You've got a car. 12 hours of Sebring. Welcome back to a big weekend of racing here on Fox. This week, NASCAR heads to Bristol for our first short track of the year. Casey Kane looks to defend his victory a year ago. Coverage begins 12.30 p.m. Eastern on Sunday only on Fox and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Back to the action under green. At the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring with Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. I'm Bob Varsha. Andrew Marriott and Chris Neville down in the pit lane. There's an airplane landing in yeah. the background. Still an active airport here at Sebring. That's one of the distractions the driver has to deal with. You look out the window and there's an airplane landing on you. It looks that way when you come down the straightaway. There's only one little wall between that aircraft and, and uh, these cars. Well, back in the day, the stories are legend of drivers, particularly at night when it is dark with a capital D here at Sebring. Drivers might spin and find themselves among the ghostly shapes of big old transport airplanes yep. still parked out there on the ramps. I did that back in 71 when we were on the five mile course, went off back there and there were cows out there. <laughs> Four legged ones. 
Tell you what, I'm liking the pace of Ricky Taylor right now. This is a big stint for him. Really, really good drive he's putting together right now. He's got around Lucas Lur there. And uh, he's chasing down the Action Express lead car right now. Car looks good too, Cal. I mean, we're watching that thing through the corners and it's really putting down a lot of power. This is the Muscle Milk team under team owner Greg Pickett. Really comes off the corners well. Won a couple of championships in the prototype division of the American Le Mans series. Look at Ricky Taylor. He yeah. is right in the wheel tracks of Joao Barbosa. Will he think about a move down in the hairpin? Thinks Boy. better of it. Black and orange, number 10. Really getting good launches, guys. When he gets off that corner, he really gets power down. It's all about getting that shock package right and hoping that the track conditions meet the setup that you put on the race car for this 12-hour event. They can make minor changes during the race, but changing the shock package is something that you can't do quickly, certainly. So they seem to have got it right. Look at the crowd back there behind these guys. Yep. Back there is the legendary Green Park, Party Central here at Sebring. Turn 13. You can get in, but you can never leave. This is where that new rear Venturi on the back of these Daytona prototypes will really have an effect through these high-speed sweepers here. High downforce, high-speed corners. It's Bishop Ben, named for John Bishop, who founded the International Motorsports Association, now known as IMSA. It's actually a fun Backward. little series of corners back there. It's fun to drive. Mm -hmm. It's a real good rhythm section, quite fast. It's a great place to watch, too, because you can see the cars coming from a long way off. The cars look good going fast in a straight line like this, but you want to see them work in the corners. Look at the patience displayed there by Ricky Taylor. Didn't force the issue, waited to see what that GTD machine was going to do. And that's what you have to do throughout the first at least 11 hours. <laughs> yeah. Last hour, you're going to go for it and uh, force the issue and stay right on the tail of that leader. But right now, he's doing the right thing. That turn 17 is so wide. I mean, there's a million different ways you can approach that corner uh, on the corner entry. But somewhere in the middle, you're going to get to the uh, to the real apex, and everybody's going to get there at the same time. Ricky was smart. He said, I'm going to just read this thing for a while, see what it uh, what it looks like is going to happen. Since the test, these cars, these Daytona prototypes, have had to run a lot less rear wing angle, a lot less downforce in the back of the car, but maintain the same dive planes on the front. And that's been a challenge for these teams coming back here this week. Essentially, you're really creating the car to be loose, kind of oversteering through the corners, and. Uh, you really have to work with the rest of the chassis set up to get that dialed out, Dorsey. You know, and, and it's going to get worse. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when we really have the sun beating down and it warms up another 10 degrees or so. This racetrack will get slippery, and you might start seeing guys putting wickers on or adding a little bit of downforce because this racetrack is notorious when it gets hot for just getting greasy. One of the big challenges here at Sebring are the pavement changes from the concrete of the front straightaway onto the asphalt with concrete patches on some of the corners. So you can never be quite sure what kind of grip you're going to have, and every corner is different. Look at this battle for third, Dorsey. Dirk Mueller in that white BMW. He's got Ollie Gavin all over him and Pat Long right behind him. They added a uh, sealer to the asphalt parts of the racetrack about a year ago, and that sealer then presented another problem when it got wet in particular. Oh, look at this, Gavin oh, stuffs it down the inside. Locks up a little bit, locked the rear brakes as he turned in, great stuff. Miller couldn't respond to the over-under. That's that turn 10, I was that's one of the best places to set a pass up. Straight line braking right there, and it's quite fast. Patrick Long in the white Porsche, Bill Oberlin in the dark 55 version of the Team RLL BMW. And the first of the SRT Vipers. Mark Goosen's driving. See the other BMW now in the mix as well. The black, the sinister looking black, number 55, driven by Bill Oberlin. He wants to be part of this party. BMW had a lot of success here, won the race here in 2011 and 2012. The debut for the Z4 last year, they had some front suspension issues that really cost them a chance of a third consecutive win, but they got a year under the belt now. It's a totally different story. That's great to see all those different marked cars running together like that. Shows the parity that uh, these classes have now. Corvette, BMW, Porsche, Vimmer, Viper. We're going to see that all season long. Just in the background there, you can see the falcon-colored 
Porsche. Great to see those guys back. Didn't run at Daytona. The supply of the car wasn't available for them, so they had to skip Daytona, but they're back and uh, feeling pretty good. Haven't had a lot of miles on this uh, bright Falcon livery machine, but uh, talking to Brian Sellers, he said last year we really struggled with rear grip at the test. It's completely the opposite. We're having to rethink our strategy in terms of where we go with tire development with this new Porsche. It's really the only car of its kind in private hands. The other ones were all factory efforts. Brian's the only non-factory driver to be competing in one of those RSRs this year anywhere. Sharing with Wolf Hensler and Marco Holzer. Brian is contracted by Falcon Tire. So Wolfie was allowed to run at uh, Daytona. Brian did not compete in any category because of his uh, affiliation with a tire manufacturer. Look at this. Lucas Lewis got around Ricky Taylor. Was it traffic? Oh, my. And count the categories. Prototypes, mixing it up with GTD cars. The blue number plates on the side of the cars tell you they are GT Daytona, the Pro-Am class. It's going to be interesting to see, Dorsey, is how the Daytona prototype configuration prototypes and the P2 machines stack up over the long run. Yeah, what no will doubt. the tire degradation be like? You would assume that the uh, prototype, the Daytona type prototype, would be the worst for the wear because of the weight, but maybe not. I mean, they've developed that tire so well. Continental doing a great job, but it's an unknown. I mean, it's the first time those cars have ever been on this surface or on this racetrack. We spoke to Ian Watt this morning, who engineers the lead car. And he, I said, can you double stint? He said, no way. P2 cars, I think they can. So that could be a fact too. Remember in pit lane, new rules, you can refuel Whilst the tire change is being done, so it puts a lot of pressure on the crews to get the tire change done, and they're only allowed two wheel guns, so you can't do a really quick stop like you see in Formula One or anything. There's only two guns, restricted personnel. It's a real orchestra down there. Yeah, it can get pretty chaotic. And the cars in their respective classes have tire limits, just 18 sets from the beginning of the weekend to the end. That includes practice and qualifying. 18 sets for the PC and GT Daytona class. 22 sets for the GT Le Mans cars, 24 sets for the prototypes. There's a look at the seven. Let's go to Greg Kramer in the pit lane. Standing by with Mike Shank and Mike, you guys may have fallen afoul of the classic definitive, well, sorry, but a rule's a rule. Oz didn't get his night laps. He's got, what, a thousand laps around here, but he didn't get his night laps. You guys were forced to start at the back, but what a performance so far. Looks like to me, Oz has the need for speed. The, uh, the EcoBoost car's running great. We double stinted, double stinted the Continental tires. Went from 60th to fourth. The car's really good. We got a long way to go. Oz has done more beyond anything I could ask him. So far, so good. Well, he certainly has shown what he's capable of. You wanted him in the car at night, obviously, so you had to take that penalty. You were talking about earlier in the week that going with the diffuser package on these Riley cars adds almost a thousand pounds of downforce. That's a very different package than you had at Daytona. Totally different animal, completely. And added to that, the, bou the bouncing that we do at this track, it's impossible to manage. And you got to chase the setup on this track. This track is really tricky. My guys, I think, have done a good job. Ford have done a great uh, job with the EcoBoost motor. It's getting better every weekend. Got the BOP a little better. We're ready to go racing. All right, good luck. You put in a great show already, I'll tell you. What they say here at this track, it's all about dampers, dampers, dampers. Guys? Well, in Mike Shank, you see the prototypical endurance sports car owner. All energy, all optimism. He is a racer to his core and a real survivor. Good luck to him and the rest of the 60 crew here at the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Another break, and we'll be back. Sebring is, is, a, is a super aggressive, tough circuit to race on. You can never relax. It's, it's physically and mentally very hard. It's when it gets dark, how difficult it is, how dark it is. The diversity uh, that is thrown at you um, is usually what creates the adversity. How difficult Sebring is. The drivers have talked about it. The team managers have spoken about it. Welcome back, everyone. 10 hours and 18 minutes to go. Brian Till, Tommy Kendall, and Justin Bell now with you in the booth down on pit lane. Greg Kramer and Darren Law and Joao Barbosa continuing to lead in the number five Action Express 
Corvette, and man, the traffic around here is intense. We knew it would be, but you watch right there, that red, white, and blue number five, that is your leader, Joao Barbosa, and he is, he's got a windshield full of different class cars. Well, it's like the racing version of Groundhog Day. I mean, you, you literally hardly get a, a corner or two. I was talking to some people, uh, Ryan Dial said he did 12 laps in practice and never went more than about four corners without having to pass someone. And of course, what happens here, what we're watching in traffic is they're lining up behind the Delta Wing there is, if you see, Lucas Lorre is right behind. This is a motor race we're watching right now. And if one, if the guy in front of you goes through, Tommy, you have to try and muscle your way through. You can drop two seconds around here. There's a lot of ground to catch up. So these guys are not taking crazy risks, but let's face it, every corner is a risk. And we heard it from Christensen uh, at the start that the intensity is, uh, is, is there and you can't afford to wait. The d days of when you could afford to be patient because you were pacing yourself, those are gone. And so the guy in front has a little tougher time because he's the first guy getting there. Uh, and now you see we had a change of position. We see the uh, second place position. Now the Wayne Taylor car, 10 over the six. Uh, and it's funny, Barbosa picked up where he left off at the Rolex. And Joao Barbosa has to be getting a little bit frustrated with the Delta Wing in front. Now he sneaks by the Delta Wing so fast in a straight line, half the weight, half the horsepower, but the same kind of speed as the other prototypes around it. And they've got great straight line speed. So Barbosa has cleared the Delta Wing. Ricky Taylor in the black number 10 Corvette from Wayne Taylor Racing has gotten past Lucas Lure. We saw that down the back straight away, and it's really great to see the P2 cars and the Daytona prototypes now on a little more equal footing than they were at Daytona. I think that's what we just actually saw, the different dynamics between the two types of cars in prototype just then. Through the corners, the Lucas Law P2 car there can be incredibly aggressive under braking and going through the tight corners. On the straights, the DP car is quicker, Tom. Well, can be incredibly aggressive and has to be incredibly aggressive. That is the tough part. Even if they get them dead even on lap time, in race conditions, you're gonna, the P2 car really needs to be a little quicker to have an even fight because where that car generates lap time under braking and corner entry, uh, is traffic affects that more than the greater power acceleration of the DP based car. So uh, that's something. Now, tire wear, I, I was talking with uh, Tony Kanan, and he said the DPs might be a little bit harder on their tires. So at the end of the stint, they might have it almost about perfect. Well, that remains to be seen. Going back to the GT LM category, the 55 BMW ride on board with Bill Oberlin giving pursuit to the 912 right in front, the battle for fifth, Patrick Long behind the wheel of the Porsche in front, and both of the new 911 RSRs were very quick at Daytona, the 912 not having the luck that they wanted, but they've been quick here too, and I tell you what though, it's the BMWs in GTLM that always seem to be kind of the sleepers. They qualified a little bit better here, but they always seem to come alive when the green flag drops for the race. Are they laying back a little bit, practicing qualifying, or is it just a better race car? Well, I mean, well. the nature of this business is, I mean, I hope there's no uh, major hurricanes or flooding anywhere because every sandbag in America is in Florida right now. Um, but at Daytona, they just didn't have the pace. They still kept themselves in contention and had a shot to win that at the end, uh, but it didn't have the pace. Everyone I talked to this weekend, uh, the first one out of their mouth has watched the BMWs. Leader in GTLM is Jimmy Bruni in that beautiful red number 62 Ferrari from Risi Competizione. And they had problems in practice here. Bruni off track, uh, Audi had spun in front of him. I don't know if there was fluid down or what, but Jimmy Bruni left the racetrack as well and did a lot of damage to the left rear in particular of the Ferrari, but the crew did a great job to get it back on track. I was actually walking down through the paddock when it came by on a flatbed and Three out of four corners had managed to be kissed, so so it wasn't looking good. But interesting in qualifying yesterday. Obviously, Bruni, I, I mean, in my opinion, I actually drove in that same team at Petit Le Mans a couple of years ago. He is extraordinarily capable in qualifying, but he was told to dial it back by Giuseppe Risi saying, you know what, you kind of lost your privilege, not that it was your fault. The privilege to get pole is now gone. Let's just get this race, because remember what happened to them at Daytona and you know, millions of dollars on the line in this kind of racing and this equipment. And they're in the race and you know what? Good call by the team management because they qualified sixth or seventh, I believe. And now they're, well, they're leading the class. Well, and, and that's a group when you walk around the paddock and you pull who you got your eyes on. The, the Ferrari in this exact spec has won every time out. It won Petit a few years ago and so forth in this exact spec with the BOP adjustments. Uh, but they said the wild card there is those guys have one speed. And so uh, it sounds like uh, 
Yeah. Oh, battle for second. Porsche inside Oliver Gavin. And gets the task accomplished there. Yeah, the Nick Tandy, I mean, such a, a great, I mean, he's more than emerging. He's emerged as a top British driver, but, you know, he's, he's making his way into the record books with some outstanding runs. And that new 911 just, it looks like a real race car, doesn't it? When you're up close, the width of it, the stature of it. But, you know, you've got to mention, you know, as you look at this, being done, we're actually not got been in our sights now, but Corvette and Porsche are so experienced uh, on these endurance races that this really is, like I said at the top of the show, it's a battle of the giants. And now we run on board with the active Mazda. Interesting, best colored car on the, in the, in the, on the grid, I think. Beautiful, beautiful paint job. This is on board the number 70, the prototype, with the diesel power, the sky active diesel, and it sounded like it was running just a little bit rough. One of the things that John Doonan talked about earlier, and you've got to be impressed with the program that they're trying to build, and we've got to acknowledge what it is, and it is a development program. Mazda acknowledges that. But the great thing is, and they pointed it out before, what tends to be some of the mechanical problems in this car is not the power plant itself, some of the drivetrain components just not being able to handle the torque that the diesel engine puts out. So right now, they're trying to build this program, and I know it's frustrating for the drivers to be out there in a car that's not running the pace, but they're building. You saw it out the window there, the challenge they're facing. Not only is it a development, it's that is largely a production power based power plant. A high, high percentage of parts are production. And you see the corner speed. And this is, uh, and they just, it, incredibly frustrating because faster under braking, obviously lighter, more power, but it really just, uh, watch, watch what happens when they get on the straightaway here. This Aston is just going to uh, get smaller out the front window, so. In theory, the prototype should be able to close down the straightaway, but more development on hand for the guys at Mazda. The 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring will continue when we come back right after this. There's a look at your leaders in the four different classes. Over years of endurance racing, Michelin has regularly shown us that tires can be double, triple, and in some cases, quadruple stinted. But with a new series comes new rules. Previously at Sebring, teams would have to fuel the car and then change tires. This year, fuel and tires can be done at the same time. So we will likely see more single stints, something the drivers are gonna like because new tires give a bit more of a performance edge. But for crew chiefs and engineers, planning started back at Daytona. Rules stipulate teams get 22 sets of tires and Michelin offers three different compounds. But that blend of different compounds had to be ordered at Daytona. On a cooler weekend, a team might use more soft compound and on a warmer weekend, more hard compound. Teams had to place that bet on the weather over six weeks ago, really adding a new element of tire management to the most challenging 12 hours in racing. And, and it is a challenge. I mean, and you guys know it. When you show up at a racetrack and the team goes, well, we don't have the compound that you wanted, Tommy. It's not at all what you want as a driver. Now, the number six muscle milk prototype is in. Darren? Yeah, they're in for a regular stop, okay, driver change. Oh, Lucas okay. is getting out. They're doing a full ball and stop with tires, fuel, everything, and a lot of cars are coming in right now. One of the issues that I was talking with with some of the teams, and we found this yesterday, is that it's getting hot. They're coming into the heat of the day, and tires are becoming an issue. Things are getting greasy, so. <laughs> Talking about how hard, how hard those guys are pushing, but they're gonna have to monitor what they're doing or they're gonna burn the tires up. You look down pit lane, you can see the number nine Action Express is in. This is on board the 90 from Spirit of Daytona. Michael Valiente getting behind the wheel. And you heard Darren say it's getting hot. We'll go back to tire compounds that the GTLM teams have a choice of. Everybody else running on Continental tires, but for the GTLM teams, we were talking about tire compounds. How big of a difference does it make, Tommy? It, well, it's, it's hard to quantify. It's different at every track, but it's funny. Talking to the Viper guys, they weren't exactly, I mean, they felt good about their chances, but they really didn't know where they stood because they'd spent most of their time on the compound that they didn't think they were going to be racing on. So they were, uh, because they were having to save those f for race conditions. And of course, though, Brian, the, the thing is, in this hotter temperature, we'll see perhaps, unlike Daytona, a lot less outlap incidents because the tires get up to temperature. At Daytona, we really struggled seeing some of those tire temperatures come up. A lot of lessons learned, but remember, half these teams haven't raced here, have not raced here for a decade and a half. 
you know, because of the, the merger of the series. So we're going to see some people really not having the database to go back to, unlike some of the others. So a lot of strategy in play, but the, as you see, the leader and uh, second place coming down pit lane right now, Brian. This is a pretty important stop because it's a 12 hour sprint. And the race has now come to pit road and really with that long full course caution that we had, this, this has really been a nice long run. Now the teams are starting to get fuel mileage numbers, they're getting tire wear numbers. So they've got the data to work on now. Crew going to work. Looks like Barbosa, no, they did do a driver change on the five. But fuel numbers, Brian, will be skewed. Uh, you see a driver change is going in. Um, but you know, the, the fuel numbers will be skewed because you can't sit behind a pace car that long and get accurate numbers. It's Bordet who just jumped on board there. He was magnificent in qualifying in behind the wheel of that car. Tommy, did you watch it out there as he went around those? You could see he was on the limit. It was like, like an Indy qualifying, amazing. And we're gonna have a position oh, change. Oh, look at that. Remember how good the Wayne Taylor racing guys were in the pits at Daytona. And there was no driver change, I don't believe, on the 10, so perhaps got hung up on the driver train driver changed just a little bit as you see Ricky Taylor there in the black number 10 there goes the muscle milk the prototype the white and black prototype so he has picked up a position and leapt to the front and it can happen in the pit lane we talk about how competitive the cars are on track so then it comes down to the team and those driver changes those pit stops problem on track for one of the prototype challenge entries inside of 17 Easy to have a problem down in 17 when the car's not on the ground half the time that's, because that's, of the bumps. Yep, that big, big uh, jump virtually. Let's go to Greg Kramer in pit lane. Down here in the wheel of number 31, and this is a stop that's taking a lot longer than they planned. They're putting some tape inside of the cockpit. When I asked him about what was going on in the stop, I wasn't as, uh, told this was going to be happening. It actually masked another problem. They had a real problem getting that right front corner on. And if you look at the left front of the car, when that eight car of Chang spun, the prototype challenge car earlier in the race, this car just grazed it as it went by and it damaged the dive planes on the front of the car. They said so far, that's not affecting things too much. Darren? Guys, same thing here. The 38 car came in and had a lot of trouble getting the left front tire on. They put it on, pulled it off, put it on, pulled it off. It really cost them in the pit lane. You know, if you're going to have those mistakes, you have them early and then you've got time to make up, but you've got to get those problems fixed because those final pit stops could be the difference. Zero two from Ganassi is in. Car looks so different with that big machine record sponsorship down the side of it from what we saw <laughs> it at really the Rolex 24. You, it is. Takes a little bit of getting used to it. Great livery though. See, he's clearing out the the air vents there because you get a lot of grass. If people are starting to go off and make mistakes, no so way. there's a lot of dirt and dust and grass. You need to keep that clear. clear, clear, clear. So Scott Dixon stays behind the wheel and heads back out in the 0-2. So pit stops beginning to cycle through and you look down the racetrack, there is the number 10 of Ricky Taylor. And the timing and scoring will cycle through as well. We saw Klaus Graf ahead of the 10 after that last pit stop. And we're actually showing Max Angelelli in the car now on timing and scoring. So perhaps Wayne Taylor Racing Crew did do a driver change. They just got it done better. Well, and even better than them was the muscle milk yep. guys. And, and the, with now that they're allowed to do fuel and tires together, it, the driver change really wasn't under much pressure before if you were, especially if you were changing tires and they were, there was more of an incentive to double stint tires. Now that's not the case. So everybody says the driver changes are likely the limiting factor. And so there's gonna be a ton of pressure on that. So if you're doing a driver change, which car do you wanna be getting in? The uh, Daytona prototype with a door and a roof or well, the prototype that's open top? For, for me, two things. One is, uh, in 80 degrees, I quite like an open top <laughs> car too. So I think it's, you know, remember that your teammate can really assist you. But as we watch coming through the notorious turn 17, that the turn of BMW was pretty out of shape there. And I'm not sure that the number eight got unsighted and hit bumps and, and just spun it around. Of course, then we heard on the radio, the starter motor wasn't working. And often when you're watching at home, you get very frustrated. Why isn't he moving? Why doesn't he get going? The starter motor was just obviously not allowing him to get going. He did and uh, had a rather adventurous pull into pit lane. It's funny, I talked to Scott Sharp and he said, according to Ryan Dial, Ryan said that it was for whatever reason, they were able to do really quick driver changes when he was in a DP. So it's not maybe the obvious uh, thing in terms of which one's quicker. So it'll be an important factor to watch and who can get their driver changes done and not be waiting to release the car. 
Well, David Chang not having a good day in that number eight Starworks prototype challenge machine, but other drivers certainly are. Scott Dixon being shown by timing and scoring. No, now Klaus Graf out in front from the 60 second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Just under 10 hours to go from the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, the 60 second running of this great event. Right now, Klaus Graf out in front in his Orica Nissan, but Max Angelelli, his Wayne Taylor racing team, Sebastian Bourdais, his Action Express team and their Corvettes have been fast all day long, and there's nothing that Chevy would like to do more than to take a victory here. They won at the Rolex 24. They want to win here again. Let's take a little bit of history lesson here from the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. When was the last time that a Chevrolet won here overall? Well, it was back in 1965, and you may recognize the car, the Chaparral. And you'll certainly recognize the name, Jim Hall. Yeah. What cool cars. Listening just... to Vic Elford last night talk about his first trip to Chaparral Raceway testing for Jim Hall. And they said, whatever you do, if the car stops on course, do not get out of the car. It's not called Rattlesnake Raceway for no reason. <laughs> for nothing. That's Look exactly at this right. battle here. It's reversed between uh, Action Express and Wayne Taylor Racing. That battle for second place. But you're seeing what the, what the prototype drivers have to deal with as far as the different classes right now. Max Angelelli trying to get around the prototype challenge car in front of him. He's got Sebastian Bourdais, one of the best in the business, right behind him. And then they had a GT Daytona car mixed in there as well. So with the traffic, it's going to be there for all 12 hours. And that's going to be the thing. you got to be patient, but you got to be aggressive. How do you, how do you balance the two? Uh, everyone's got their own <laughs> plan for that. <laughs> But it's very fluid. I think we should point that out to, it's not an anomaly that there's traffic at Sebring. It is Sebring, it is yep. Daytona, it is multi-class sports car racing, and in 1950, I'm sure they complained about the traffic. So, you know, it's it, just what happens is now is that all these cars have their different strong points. I mean, the PC car can be so quick under braking compared to a GT, but not as fast on the straight. So we, I mean, right now is a great example. We've got the Viper there on the left, the new 911 on the right, and you see he's squeezed. He didn't know he couldn't do much there against the Taylor, against um, the the action uh, velocity to Shiba car, but he couldn't do much with him there because he has to use all the road. He's a GT car committed to his line. There's a lot of dynamics. So remember, by this point of the race, a lot of the world's top drivers are in each car. We're at that point of the race that some of the best drivers in the world are behind the wheel. So I think there's a lot of synergy between what they're doing. Things change a little later. That scenario just highlighted exactly the challenge for the slower cars as well. You can't just always err on the side of caution because otherwise you just lose too much time. So that's the tough part. Uh, you know, the, the fast guys are like, why didn't he give me more room? The guy in the slower car is like, I'm trying to keep tap, uh, contact with that Viper or whatever the car might be. Well, and, and the 912 Porsche that you saw in there, the number 912, that's your leader in GTLM. So, you know, they're working through the leaders. You ride on board right now with Johannes Van Overbeck running fifth. Scott Pruitt right in front of him in the Daytona prototype. You talked about strengths and weaknesses. I wonder if the P2 chassis aren't going to be a little bit more nimble in some of this traffic. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, it's, but again, it's, I mean, they, uh, Pluses and minuses, you know, they, they, again, they generate their lap time under braking and corner entry, which if there's a, you're behind a car, and so you really have to come from a long ways back. You have to commit, but sometimes when you commit back there to, and you can't, it, you have so much momentum, it, you're making a, taking a huge risk because you commit back there and then you only find out at the apex whether the right, guy saw you or not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you're gonna ask me how I'd like to have a fast car sitting there with my right foot planted the floor down the straight is a nice way to gain some time. Yeah, if you can get her to handle on the straightaway, that's <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really hard to, hard to uh, it doesn't go away. Van Overbeck slid a little wide off the corner, his teammate, one of the best sports car racers in the world, David Brabham, right behind him in the number one from Extreme Speed Motors. Bordet got a, a got, a, but he, uh, Max is. Uh, it's not his first rodeo, so he's uh, taking the inside there. And Bordet again, uh, not willing to push the issue just yet. Well, and for Max Angelelli, he had to make the move on the GT Daytona car in front of him. Oh, and a problem for the 51. That's 17, also. Oof. That's long before. Well, that's the middle of the corner. And at the other end of the track, a problem for one of the prototype challenge cars. 
You see, if you notice that prototype challenge car, very easy for a flat bottom car like that, so low, to get beached on those curbs. They're not actually particularly high, but when you're only two inches off the ground, it's easy to get beached. But of course, right now, the 51 Ferrari waiting to rejoin. It's pretty fast traffic moving through turn 17, and uh, you make a good judgment call to rejoin. And the 85 was the prototype challenge machine that we saw off, and he will re-enter Jerry Kraut in the 85. Jerry, a very accomplished guy in the Star Mazda series. I mean, he's not the youngest driver in the field by any stretch of the imagination, but he says this prototype challenge car is a ball to drive. This is down in 17. Wow, the 51 just in too hot or had some sort of a braking issue. That is the best thing about turn 17 right there. The multi-layers of tire wall that are there, and you saw the tires move really protected the car, but more importantly, protected the driver at a very high speed impact zone. And of course, they're going to have to check the car over now. If this was tennis, we'd call that a double fault because no one else was involved other than him on the way under braking for 17. Klaus Graf leading here, and this muscle milk picket racing team really seems to have found the handle on this Orica Nissan. Greg? Well, that's maybe a great way to put it. All that great battling you're calling happening behind the number six muscle milk picket racing car. Greg Pickett, obviously you guys struggled at Daytona in, in terms of speed. Now it's a different setup on the DP package here, but they seem to have got it pretty right. You guys are out front. It's come alive for you. Yeah, I have great compliments to Scott Elkins and the guys working with the bounce performance. They had a very difficult job bringing those two things together. But you can see, you can see the times are very, very close. Uh, Lucas did his typical great first stint. He's a real battler, you know that, Greg. Did a wonderful job. The team gave him a great stop, which I'm very appreciative of. We've been working really hard. We've been to the shaker, we've been to the tunnel. We're going out, you know, we had a tough time at Daytona, but we're fighters here at Muscle Up Picket Racing. And I don't want anybody to forget that. We're going to be tough here. Well, you continue to prove it. And, uh, you know, one of the, of, of the interesting things is when you're in heavy traffic, horsepower is everything. It, it, it helps, yet you guys have been able to use that lighter, less powerful package and work through traffic nicely. Yeah, about our only uh, difficulty in that road, you're exactly right, Greg. But uh, when we get right behind the DP cars, they've got a lot of downforce and they take away our, our turn in and our braking capability a little bit. Not terrible, but Lucas says it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, racing's supposed to be a big, a bit of a challenge, right? It was easy, everybody be doing it. Not the best in the business. Good luck. Big, big implications here. And look at the rear of the car. It looked like fluid coming from the back of the Porsche just then as he rejoined. I hope that is not the case and it was sand, but... Yeah, I mean, typically you see fluid, uh, uh, that, something off the right fender front. Rub. Or fender rub. Fender I was going to say, typically where the radiators are on the Porsche up front, that's yeah, but there's where you cooling, see the fluid. There's cooling in the back there. But no, the back looks unscathed. It must have been sand pouring out. Yeah. I apologize for that. And there is the oh, 85. Obviously a little meeting of the minds, I think, as they came into that corner there. Very tight, though. Tommy, you know what it's like? You come down that little short chute through that very tight right, left, right, left onto the straight and there you have it as you're just unwinding. Uh, that's pretty. Dodged another, another Dodged ball right another there. One. Wow, cars are all over the place. We know that the temperature is heating up. The track's getting a little greasy, but you wonder if there's not some fluid down because a lot of cars leaving the racing surface right now. This is where the 85 is. Uh, already see. committed to going to the left, and that car may be on cold tires leaving the pits, just lost it. I think they actually both got away with that quite lightly. I mean, I know he's got fender rub on it and hopefully it isn't going to cause too many problems, but we said it. Oh, look at that, another, something is getting yeah. very strange out there. Problems We've had four the spins 7. in in a lap. Yeah, there's got to be fluid down somewhere. Different corners though, Brian. Yep. So something, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, the new set of drivers get in the cars and that may be causing some of it. Nicely executed then, because when you've got people coming down that straight at 165 miles an hour, you want to get that uh, out of the braking zone. But This is where the good team manager comes into play and the radio working comes into play. And you get on the radio and you're telling your drivers, look, a lot of cars off right now. Be patient, take your time, look for fluid, be careful. We, this is a 12 hour race. We've got nine hours and 48 minutes yet to go. Full evaluation of the 911 Porsche as he comes into pit lane. He was involved in that incident. They're going to have to check it over. We saw 
a smoke from the front right. So uh, while they, what happens with the teams, they go to do a standard pit stop first. And while the wheels are out, they start to evaluate. Yeah, they know they're going to have to do this. So they do this, and it gives them a little bit more ch uh, chance to look at it. Um, we'll see if they go up and check out that right front. Yeah, he's holding with the wheel. He's, he's getting he's in there. Inside. So work going on on the 911, the Porsche entry. Remember, this team, they won the Rolex 24 just seven weeks ago. Can they come back and win here at Sebring? Tonight, the UFC returns to Fox Sports with UFC 171 prelims as the Ultimate Fighter se Season 17 winner, Kelvin Gastelum, takes on Rick Story plus other epic bouts. It all begins with the pre-fight show at 7 p.m. Eastern on Fox Sports 2 and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Welcome back to Sebring. I think we've seen some Ultimate Fighter stuff going on here on the racetrack. A little bit of argy-bargy, but certainly lots of cars with problems is now the 87 around on track with Bruce Hamilton behind the wheel. We'll get you up to speed, nine hours and 44 minutes remaining here in the 60 second running of the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. But let's catch up on how it all began with our race recap. At the drop of the green, the number five Action Express Corvette out in front, and really the first couple of laps were pretty clean. We thought there might be some action with 63 cars starting, but uh, then the action started. Things heated up and not the way we wanted them to as Ben Keating has a fire in his number three Viper. That is one of one. Uh, heartbreaking. Significant damage. And then damage to the number three. That happened in the very opening laps, and this was going to be a long stop on pit lane. Long stop, but Corvette always prepared for these eventualities. They train harder than anyone at this. But however, in the first opening minutes of a 12-hour race, you don't want to be staying in the pit lane for this long. But if you're going to have a problem, have it early so you can come back. And then a problem for Michael Avenatti. Yeah, he nailed you. Anyway, back underway. Copy that. There's some stuff on the back, but I'm not sure that it has any meaning. It was showing six of you. We'll see you when you go by. Copy. As far as I can tell, I should stay out. Ah, gosh, I've got so much dust in my eyes. Yeah, but I can see. <laughs> but I can see. <laughs> Off we go. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what he was screaming there, but yeah. Well, and, and the reality is we've only shown you half of the, the incidents <laughs> or less. Yeah. It really is. You made the UFC uh, analogy. Uh, it is full contact. Nobody has tapped out yet, though. So we are um, we are in it to win it. Now, we saw that uh, we saw the 911 car. And, you know, for those of us that went to Le Mans last year and then at Daytona, those factory Porsches have been flawless in 48 hours. And even though that had, was not the slightest bit his far, fault, it's nice to know that they don't have a, you know, a lucky horseshoe stash somewhere and that they, they are not impervious to it. They've made it look easy. We all know it's not easy. Uh, we're going to see how they uh, how they bounce back from that and recover. And of course, it doesn't matter where in the end of the, as you come up in those last couple of laps of 12 hours tonight, you reflect back and you go, it wasn't my fault. It was my fault. Whatever the reason is, the fact is that getting your car touched early on in the race could have a repercussion later. And that is the same. We said every 24 and every 12 hour and every 10 hour race, you need to keep your car clean to have the best shot of winning at this race. Well, remember one of the keys to winning here is the unknown. How do you deal with the unknown when that, that unexpected mechanical issue comes up, when somebody spins into you? How ready is your crew to repair it, the spare parts that they have on hand? How quickly can they react? And that's why the teams with so much experience always seem to be the ones who do well. But right now, like you said, no lucky horseshoe. Well, and this, this yellow is helping them because the yep. average speed is way down. So the amount of ground they're losing is, I mean, it, they're still going to have to come back. Uh, and it, the car didn't look that bad, but obviously something underneath was damaged to the point, support structure or something. They're actually putting in, look, a new inner fender, uh, inner fender there. So let's hope Darren Law is down there. And perhaps, Darren, you got an update on exactly what the damage is. 
Yeah, guys, Patrick Pillay had a prototype spin in front of him. They said he had nowhere to go and had to hit him, unfortunately. And uh, it's, there's no suspension damage, but it's damaged a lot of the bodywork, the front nose, the carrier for the headlights. So it's a very time-consuming stop. The good thing is on some of the earlier Porsches, as you look without the front fascia on there, you can see that the radiators aren't nearly as exposed on either side that they used to be in a 911 type derivative. If you made contact where the radiator was on the corner there was a big issue. Here's what happens to Pele. And it doesn't look like that big a hit. And he really, he was, he was starting to move around him yep. and the car spun right into his path. So um, now with the new unified rules, it is easier. It's not easy, but it's easier to get uh, to get your lap back. So um, again, this is if I mean it might be too much to overcome, but this is a godsend for them. The fact that this is taking place under a yellow. That you've it. got nine hours and thirty nine minutes left to get it done. We saw the problem for the number three Corvette earlier on. It was Antonio Garcia who was behind the wheel. He's now with Greg Kramer. Yeah, you guys talked about the best teams, best deal with those unknowns. And unfortunately, Antonio, we just did a highlight package and you were in it for the wrong reasons. What happened first to cause that damage? I mean, it was a big, big hit for sure. I mean, from the cameras, I think all the guys didn't know that what happened really there, but I got really, I got hit really, really big time by Nick Tandy in the back. So I was saving a little bit some distance with the 56 and he just launched me into the into the BMW basically so I couldn't do anything and I don't know I mean he, he probably got hit the same way so I don't know where it started really but I mean we all know we need to park the car there I mean it's a traffic jam into turn three usually and basically I tried to do, I tried to do the, the, the best thing just to stay safe with the car in front of me but he just launched me into the other one so unfortunately we we broke the front splitter and the full nose so decided to change the whole thing even if if i if i if i was still in contact with them so then following stint was good i mean the car is has the pace for sure so i think now we just need to find the the best strategy to to get back that lap and go back up well the brain trust here at corvette racing is up to that good news the car is working okay it's interesting, Justin, you said it. I mean, sometimes the damage appears much later, and what we just found is that two other cars were involved in that collision with the number three Corvette. So what kind of damage on the 911? Well, maybe they're taking care of that right now, but you heard him say the BMW was involved as well. We still have a long way to go from the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. I think North American Endurance Championship is really special, and I'm really excited that Patron jumped in and, and, and sponsored the, that whole championship. It's a championship really within a championship. It gives the teams that aren't geared up to run 10 or 11 races the chance to go for maybe just four. It, it locked in all the great racetracks, so, you know, you know Daytona, Sebring, uh, the Glen, and then finishing up at Petit Le Mans. And, you know, they're a little out of incentive to, to win those races and win that championship, so I think it's going to be great for the teams. It's truly an endurance championship, so maybe a, a different mental approach in how you prepare the car, um, how you fund the car, and, and getting through those four races is key to probably winning that North American championship. The Tequila Patron North America Endurance Championship, and there's a look at the four different class leaders. These are the teams right now, and if you look down to GT Daytona, down at the bottom, level five motorsports, well, they've withdrawn. They're not gonna be running anymore this year, but the points that they scored at Daytona, that has them right now in the lead for the North American Endurance Cup, so uh, that's gonna change today. That one's gonna change for sure, but you know, it's interesting, as Scott Sharp said it, it's, it's a, a true endurance championship. Yeah, and it's uh, one of the, I would encourage you at home to play along like we are in the booth. The points are awarded at four, eight, and 12 hours. So when those points are calculated, everyone in the booth is gonna take a, a shot of a Tequila Patron. <laughs> and uh, it's a way to keep everybody fully engaged. I thought you had to do I four shots be at- 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get that memo. Four, eight, and 12 shots is what I thought it was. As you see the leaders come to pit road because pits now open for prototypes. And your leader to the marks in the number six, Greg. Klaus Grav hits it, waves off the water bottle, so obviously he's really comfortable out there right now. Check with the Continental Tire guys. They said the tire temperatures after a long stint in this car were right on the marks. Go, 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 oh, go, go, he go. stalled it. He just stalled it. And the spot nailed. Very strong, then stalled it. Let's get down. 
Hey guys, I'm at the 90 pit and they're basically just doing a re routine stop, filling up with fuel. They're not gonna do tires. They did them recently. One of the things they're really stressing right now, as you guys have seen, we're not even to halfway and there's a lot of attrition. They're telling their guys, back off, be smart, don't make mistakes. When you saw the mistake on the part of Klaus Graf with that stall, but you, you've got to note that that Orica Nissan package that Muscle Milk has is brand new to them. So they're learning that chassis and that power plant. They had been running HPD products in years past. And you see now this is a replay of Klaus Graf. Now let's watch the 10 and the five. Bourdais also stalls and Gilelli does not. So those guys, yeah, the, uh, and Bourdais still trying to get it cranked. As we said, you can lose positions in pit lane, Bourdais. Do they keep hot tires on those cars? I think they, Do, they have. Because that, that is not as easy. You can't spin the tires as you come out. You can't break traction. And uh, no excuse, but it is harder to get out of the pit lane. Well, and usually the, if, if that is the case, they usually remind you on the radio for a couple reasons. Not only is it harder to get the car going, it's also much harder on the drive line. So with cold tires that don't have a grip, you can just blaze them and it doesn't hurt anything. If they're hot, they don't want you to put that huge shock through the drive line. And they're going to tell you, hey, ease out of the pits if they did not change tires. And you saw how busy it was on pit road. And that is why the officials have split prototypes from GT. Can you imagine the 63 cars coming in there with those pit stalls trying to get pit stops done? So a good call for the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. Prototypes and GT cars split there on pit lane. GT cars will be in next, and then we'll be back to more green flag action from Sebring International Raceway. Make sure you join us. Remember, you can enter for a chance to win the industry's most awarded car of the year, the 2014 Corvette Stingray Convertible. Visit racetowincorvette.com now for your chance to win. And Tommy, you need to read all that fine print down there at the bottom of that graphic. <laughs> Purchase not required. And there you have it. All right, under caution, GT cars just made their pit stops here at Sebring International Raceway. You see the clock at the top of the screen, nine hours, 28 minutes yet to go. And Klaus Graf out in front in his Orica Nissan. Hopefully the, uh, that Magnus car does not jump into the Chevy Open House event. <laughs> So it's great as we uh, look up on here, you uh, to see David Brabham back here. He was chatting with him. You know, David's he really had a little sabbatical over the last couple of years, focusing on other things and business. And we we're talking yesterday. He he said I had to step away just to 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 kind of refocus my mind. And he came back last year just as fa faster than ever. And uh, so it's just nice uh, to see him. Up. I was actually his best man, and he was mine. So, so I had have to, to plug nice the old about, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, there um, you go. But of course, and Jeff Brabham was here uh, along with Matthew. So quite a Brab Brabham affair this weekend. Remember Sebring, while these cars are driving around behind the pace car, Sebring attracts luminaries and, and uh, the, the famous from our sport because it's not the Hollywood kind of fame. It's the people that, whether, whether it's Hurley Hayward, whether it, you, know, you see my dad, all sorts of people come here because they appreciate quite what Sebring means. So, you know, at the start of the race, they were all down there in Pitley and Tommy Kendall. Where? Yeah. <laughs> Scott Dixon now to the top as things have cycled through after pit stops. But there's a look at the number five, Sebastian Bourdais. Remember, he had problems leaving the pit stall just a few minutes ago. Let's l take a listen to some of the radio traffic. I think I know what it is. There must be something in the TC settings or something which can be turned off when the you're on pit lane cruise, but I don't think we got to that point yet, so I bet that's what it was. When you see the near miss for the 10 on the 9 as they come out, and he said something in the TC setting, so the traction control, they want that off so you can get that wheel spin when you leave. Yeah, and they, that's what they, they have. They can literally, pro, uh, infinite ways to program, and they call that logic, and every team has different ways of doing it. You can say, okay, when pit speed is engaged, if you're in this gear, if, 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 then you want to cut traction control, you want to do this up until X speed. You, it's literally infinite what you can program the cars to do. And, and one of the things uh, that we did at Viper is, you know, one of the keys last year, you had to shut the engine off on, on pit stops. Now you don't have to do that, but we actually were monitoring air jack pressure 
and the engine would crank, but it would not provide spark until the pressure in the air jack dropped below a certain pressure and it fired as quick. Everybody's looking for fractions of a second, and so uh, it sounds like they have an issue there that, that caused the car to stall, and they'll be looking into that um, uh, between now and then to see if there's a different setting on the wheel or they can do some sort of an adjustment. One of the stalwarts in sports car racing, especially in the GT category over the last several years, has been Flying Lizard Motorsports. Darren Law is down in their pit. I'm here with Thomas Blum. He's chief strategist for Flying Lizard. You know, we all see what the driver does on the track and what the pit crew does in the pits, but one of the things behind the scenes that nobody really follows heavily is strategy. And this is what Thomas does. He calls strategy for, for, the, for their team, their, their race strategy, their, their pit stop strategy. Thomas, how hard is it for you? We've got four classes. You guys are in GTD. What kind of challenges do you have with that? Well, obviously a 12-hour race, and especially in GTD where you've got uh, amateur drivers and professional drivers, um, you know, you really got to plan out ahead. And the amateur drivers have to do quite a bit of drive time this year in the, in the new series. So, you know, you really got to think ahead. How do you get your guys? It may be not quite as quick. Uh, a lot of the laps early in the race so that you can race for the win late in the race. But, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the races, past histories, um, you know, how many cautions are early when the cautions happen. So, you know, a lot goes into it. Obviously, when some cautions come up, it may change your plans. But, um, you know, a lot goes into it. And obviously, with such a big field of cars, close to 25 cars, uh, you know, we got our work cut out for each other, for, for ourselves. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Back to you guys one of the smartest men you'll find down in pit lane. And that's where that strategy comes in. There's a look at the 45, the Flying Lizard, one of the Audi R8s, and it's Alessandro Latif behind the wheel right now. And they've made that move from Porsches into the Audis this year because they really thought it would be a better weapon in the GT Daytona category. And the car is absolutely beautiful, and they are fast. Well, and they came within a whisker. Uh, they, they were actually the winner of the Rolex for a brief period, uh, but that, that crossover was seamless for them. They were fully competitive throughout and, uh, and ended up coming with a strong second place finish at Daytona. Hey guys, the, uh, the Flying Lizard guys just talking with Thomas. One of the issues they're having right now, they have a fuel pressure warning light going through turn 17 in both of their cars. They're very concerned about something happening with the fuel. That's one of the reasons they came in and just topped up. They're not sure that they can run an entire tank through a stint. Now, that's interesting. I wonder if something has come loose in the fuel cell itself and it's not getting the pickup if that, with those massive bumps down in turn 17. And you don't want that. I mean, you've got to have the full run on a tank of fuel, but both cars both seems odd. Both cars is odd, but that's why racing is odd. <laughs> that's why know. you wonder if mechanically it's not a part. The same part is yeah. broken in there. I mean, the bumps here at Sebring, I, I know you see them on television and they look big, but seeing them is one thing, riding yeah. over them is something entirely different. Well, right now, as they come down that back, state brand, uh, back straight, of course, turn 17 you're just talking about is perhaps the most dynamic in terms of car suspension corner, almost probably in North American road racing. Um, but the cars, of course, at the front there, Scott Dixon in the O2 car, it's, he has the run of the track right now. He controls the pace as they come through 17. The pace car has just pulled off to the right and everyone getting very racy behind because there's four different categories green, green, in the green. first probably 10 cars and it is a green flag and Scott has a nice clean start. And, and what, unlike the initial start where you have to wait until you've crossed start finish to improve position, the minute you hear green on the radio or you, you watch the yellows to drop at the individual corners, races on, you can pass anywhere. Scott Dixon with a big leap at the drop of the green begun to pull away because you look back through the field the next prototype entry that he's racing with is mired back in this gaggle of cars I saw some uh, action there the viper losing two spots to the porsches christensen just blasted past there on the inside of 17 there because he has to because up in front of him a first and second place Corvette, the number four, Tommy Milner, all over the back of that red Ferrari, Matteo Malicelli, Parisi Competizioni. So great to see Malicelli back after the huge impact that he took in that crash with Memo Gidley at the Rolex 24. Back and still very quick. And, and remember the finish last year where Tommy Milner put in that unbelievable final stint and was able to track down that Ferrari and get around him 
uh, to win the, the Rolex last year. And that was one where I think Tommy Milner really kind of came into his own. Uh, we talk about who you want in the car at the end. It's always been Ollie Gavin, but last year they wanted Tommy Milner in at the end, and he uh, he delivered the goods. And I think we're seeing him set him up now for the back straight as he comes through onto turn 15. He's going to be going onto the back straight there, but the Corvette looked like it has the edge in handling through the infield. So let's see if he's got the pace down the straight coming into 17. Bad news for Klaus Groff and his muscle picket racing team. They'll have to come down pit road for a speeding violation during that last stop, and he'll have to serve it under green. That's not what they wanted to see. And he, you saw him go off the road in 13. That might be when they delivered the news to him. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. What? He had several penalties last year that he didn't want to hear. And now a problem between two prototype challenge cars. 87. It looks like the 87 is and one of 48. them. It's Scott Dixon continuing to lead here. The 60-second running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. We'll be right back after this quick break because there is plenty of action yet to come. Under full course caution at Sebring International Raceway, the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. It's Scott Dixon who leads overall to prototype challenge cars getting together actually teammates the 88 and the 87 bar one motorsports got together and have brought out the full course caution yet again they say yellows breed yellows and that's exactly what we just had well it's going to be time to say goodbye to our fox sports one viewers but remember live coverage continues in just a few minutes on fox sports go and imsa.com we'll take you to the checkered flag and beyond so join us there and if you miss any of the action today Join our highlighted coverage tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time here on Fox Sports 1. For Tommy Kendall, Justin Bell, Greg Kramer, Darren Law, and Brian Till, thanks for joining us here, and we'll continue our Sebring coverage in just a moment online. We'll see you there. Full course caution yet again. Welcome to streaming coverage of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. The Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring from Sebring International Raceway. Nine hours, 16 minutes to go in this 12 hour event. 62 years, it's pretty amazing the history that we've seen here over all those years. The different champions, the different drivers that have come through. And you know, they said at the beginning of the show, this is hallowed ground. You walk some of that same pavement, some of the best sports car drivers in history have ever walked down before and it, it's uh it's pretty sobering it's a special place tommy uh, Dreesy, uh fellow trans am runner uh looking out the back to see uh and the, and the, you see the papa on the front his father's pretty ill and his dad's been a shoe supporter yeah. was at a lot of trans am races and everything so tommy who brings a sponsor to get in one of these cars actually forgo his forgave or gone for went for went <laughs> his uh sponsor placement to put his papa on the car well it looks like the 87 had a problem a gt car went wide and tommy was involved with that so a special hello and hope you're feeling better to papa dreesy is tommy trying to work with the crew to get the car back actually i don't think that's, that's not that's tommy. tommy in the car no, but uh, i've i've met mr dreesy and tommy he came here as a an immigrant from morocco and he worked in the Firestone plant in Los Angeles, and he was such a, a proud man. He wore a suit and tie every day to the plant. And so Tommy has just hustled and, and, and built quite a nice sized business that affords him the chance to race, but he speaks uh, in uh, very, very admirable terms of, of his father. Tommy, one of those good guys in the sport. As you see, Doug Bielfield looking on and trying to talk to the safety workers and. Bielfeld saying, hey, we got to get the car back. I want to get back in this thing. We still have plenty of times to get back in it. But I think we should talk about the frustration that is building right now. Multiple yellows is really breaks down the tempo of the race, not just for us watching and us talking about it, but inside the car as a driver. We talk about variables. We talk about risk. We talk about all the different things that go on at a difficult track and race like Sebring, but actually told me they are a little easier when the race is running green because you know who's around you you know who just went in the pit lane there's a you know if the leaders go by you and you're in a gtd car they're not going to go by you the next lap because it takes them 
seven or eight laps to catch you up again or whatever it is. So the tempo, the rhythm goes is discombobulated right now for everybody, including the strategists who, by the way, are pounding the numbers like, like the uh, geniuses they are. Well, and the strategists that are working the hardest, and this will be something to keep an eye on, uh, that three car that's trying to get back on the lead lap, any cars that are a lap down in any classes, now they, they do the first wave around so that you don't lose a portion of a lap, and then when they do the lap down wave by, if you are in front of your class leader, you will get to come back again, and so it's much easier, it's not easy, but it's much easier to get your lap back. So I, I'm gonna keep a close eye on that number three Corvette to see if they can get back on the lead lap this quickly. Greg Kramer and Darren Law down in pit lane, they'll keep track of the strategy down there and how those engineers and strategists use the information that they get to try to get their drivers back on the lead lap. It's about knowing where you are and it's really, even though it's a 12 hour race, the engineers a lot of time start at the end and they'll back time all the way to the beginning to try to figure out how they wanna play their games. So that front, that was the, the lead Ferrari and Vet. So the Ferrari stayed out, but the, the Vet did come in. Again, there you see a split of, split of, I mean, we don't know his fuel requirements. Difference in tactics. Some people prefer to run with track position. Others are making the most of refueling right then. Now we talked earlier about prototypes in GT cars on pit lane at different time, but we just had a full course caution. They had just gone back to green. So if you have another one within a few minutes afterwards, the pit lane's open for everyone. Let's check back in with Greg. Well, the pit lane's open for everyone, and because it's a short yellow, a lot of these teams electing to not do tires. They just topped off the vet. He's gone. When I was talking to Dave Sims and Reese, they were looking at coming in, doing the math, and they said, you know what? We think we're going to stay out. We're still okay, but if they were coming in, tires only. This is such a short yellow period. Well, and whether this was a factor or not, that will keep the three car from getting back on the lead lap. And I heard afterwards, in terms of how closely these guys think about things that even us in the booth don't think about, Action Express at Daytona split their two cars, the five and the nine, and they had them, they were actively trying to keep the Ganassi car from getting their lap back. So one car would pit, but only one would pit on each yellow, so that there was always a car in front of uh, that Ganassi car, you know, basically blocking that move. Well, and that's where the strategy really comes in, and that's where the, the advantage of having two cars comes in. You think about Risi Competizione, they've got their one Ferrari up against two Porsches and two Corvettes, so that's where having that extra bullet in the gun sometimes really helps. Hey guys, down here with a muscle milk car, you talk about strategy, these guys were at the back of the pack, uh, they had really just... They really said there was no there was no need to worry about tires, fuel, or anything. We're at the back anyway. Let's do everything. So they did a complete stop. They started from the back. They're going back to the back. But now they have fresh tires and a full load of fuel. And, of course, a pit lane that wasn't chaotic. And that, that, that counts for a lot as well. That Remember the, the yellow flag before? Mayhem. Right now, they could maybe take care of some business that, uh, in a very calm way. And, and he has a pretty clear track to the back of the field. But as they're preparing to go green, I hope in the next couple of laps, you the lights have just gone out on top of the pace car there. Once again, they've got to get themselves spooled back up, Tommy, going down the back straight. And it's, it's you know what, it's like the start of a new race every single time. Now watching the Ganassi cars this weekend, and I know the guys talked about some personnel changes within that team, and we've not seen the performance that you typically expect out of Ganassi, and you wonder, it is a team sport, and you guys know it so well. That chemistry, that camaraderie, when you change one ingredient in the mix, it can change the recipe, it can change the outcome, and maybe that team working to try to find their way again, get that chemistry back now that there have been some personnel changes. And guys, there's a little bit of development going on. Some of the engineers down here for the GTLM teams really starting to study the weather. It's warming up. It's cool and breezy, but we're still starting to get more temp in the track, and they're starting to look at the tires. Do we want to make a compound change or at least make a pressure change in those tires to keep these cars running at the optimum? They're starting to do some of that strategizing and some of the math on the numbers right now. Well, I I live in Columbus, Ohio, so I think it's been really warm down here the entire time I'm here because we've had the most brutal winter up there. I, I've enjoyed it. Right now, Scott Dixon enjoying a clear racetrack in front of him as the green flag falls. We're back to racing, and you see the number 10 Corvette, that black and orange number 10 Corvette, get bottled up on the inside and around the outside. 
The number five of Sebastian Bourdais from Action Express sweeps high around the outside, and Max Angelelli disappears back to third. He got caught in traffic. And it, it's worth pointing out, you know, that the Ganassi car commented how it doesn't, uh, the new paint job, that big machine records. Uh, Scott Dixon is the big machine. He's been in that car <laughs> almost three hours on this hot day. There is a maximum drive time. You cannot drive more than four hours. I suspect that uh, they'll they'll run this tank out and then they'll switch him out. But uh, he's earned his uh, earned his keep already. I think the other thing to note is history plays a lot here at Sebring, and Calvin talked about it earlier. The Daytona prototype teams they don't have a lot of data from here, and a lot of the teams that came from the American Le Mans series who have run here for years and years have that data. So you look back on it, if you've not had any experience here or much experience in a Daytona prototype-based prototype, um, you might be missing some of those little magic tweaks that you need to get around this very bumpy circuit. Not only that have data here, in this configuration with the, the big wing and the diffuser, they, they don't have very much data anywhere other than a little bit of testing, and the spec has changed continuously. So it's putting more load through all of those parts. Uh, so a big question mark, what we think of as a proven package uh, is maybe not as proven, especially on this, uh, the roughest circuit that we go to. When you look at what we have here in terms of the driver lineup we're staring at in that car, I mean, Jao Barbosa, Max Angelelli, there, we know them, they're our sports car heroes. But this is like the good old days, to have a, an IndyCar champion like Scott Dixon out front and, and Tony Kanaan just waiting to get in. It's amazing to me because the fans are really responding because it's almost like we're hosting such a good party that they want to come to it. And I think, I mean, you've got to thank Chip Ganassi for, for doing that um, because he brings great talent to the field. Brian Frizzell and the other Corvette from Action Express rolling down pit road. You see that in the box on the left as you watch the action and a big crash. It's the oh, 62 no. running third in GT. Matteo Malicelli off in turn one. Extensive damage to the left side of that Ferrari. Oh, I think I just could hear Giuseppe Risi from up in the tower here. Oh my God, this team is just, I mean. Wow, that's a big hit. Having a hard oh, oh no! no. That, is that was the 30 Momo entry in the GT Daytona category. Rejoining the track, oh. he got right into the middle of that oncoming traffic. Turn 17, the exit of it is so committed. You are in a GT car, truly committed. And last thing is probably looking in your mirror for a fraction yeah. of a second. You don't expect someone to pull in from the right. Whatever damage was on the 62 is now being compounded into real damage. The 56 BMW with a problem as well. You see the damage to the bodywork on the front there, and that's more than just bodywork, I think. Looked like suspension damage. You, you just, you can't re-enter like that. You just can't do it. Well, it's funny, because when I was talking to people about traffic, the obvious traffic that people talk about is the inexperienced guys, hugely experienced guy here. And that is just a, a you know, that's, you just don't do that. You know, there's nothing, the, the risk reward, there's no upside to that. He's already had an incident, he's already going to the pits to wait until it's it's truly clear. Let's focus Such on BMW here, Tommy, because I really hope that that is, you know, the obviously hard on the left. Oh, look, as he rejoins here. And you he see the car get out of the air. Yeah, that, it, it's not it's, turning well, and he pulls literally into the middle of the racetrack. Yeah. At the exit to one of the highest speed corners door exposed. on the track. Door exposed. Yep, door exposed. And yeah. Dirk Werner in the BMW, in the 56 BMW, he was running in fifth. You see the Momo GTD entry. So, oh, oh. how's it Self-inflicted. He, you know, he, got, he, he got crossed up and he overcorrected and it went in on the right. I mean, it, I believe. I'm not throwing him no, under the bus no, no, there, but it was yeah. it was a spin. The, the odd thing to me was there was a lot of motion in the back end of the, of the 62 when it went in from the first look that we had. Yeah, I really feel sorry for the, the number 30 Momo car there because he tried at the last, as he's going right to the exit, he tucked it to try and not track she, out. She tried. That's Christina. Would you know, thanks for that, Tommy. She. <laughs> take, a look at, take a look at the 62 again. It could just be... The motion in the back, yeah, it's not as much motion as I thought yeah. it was. I think you were right, Justin. I think it stepped out it on just him, stepped on him it, and it hooked. Yeah. Remember, that is that is when you get it right, your car's good. It's trying it's to such give a the benefit of the doubt. Corner. And <laughs> I was just double-guessing myself as well. 
it's an oh, he goes in there. He that, goes that's in a there. scary thought. You're really humping through there, and so it's it, it's very possible that TC cut in, yep. and and it had a more dramatic yep. reaction. We have seen in that. That. But you know what the trouble is? Is that the damage they would have been able to continue through the whole of this race? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, but yeah. not now. 56 trying to get back to the pits. They'll make it back. That's Dirk Werner behind the wheel. And I'll tell you what, that's a walk you don't want to make back to the pit to see Giuseppe. No, not for the uh, second time. In and weeks. the team, my heart goes out to the team. I mean, Mateo's out of the car walking away. It, it's good that he appears to be okay. That team has worked so hard. There are very few parts on that 62 that made the trip to Florida earlier in the year to Daytona after the massive crash and the rebuild that they had to do. And now for the team that had worked so hard, their day is done and we still have nine hours to go. There's wow. Giuseppe Ricci. Yeah, what a wonderful man. What he has contributed to Ferrari's race presence in North America is is without parallel any in the world, anywhere in the world. He does it off his own back, really, in terms of his momentum and energy and, and funding. and. But let's just, hopefully one of our colleagues is down in the pit lane to check on how that BMW is doing because uh, these guys, look at them at Daytona. If you talk to them on Thursday at Daytona, they were nowhere. <laughs> By race day, they were right there. And I think we were in position here to see some the same sort of thing happening here. But you could see that wheel was completely buckled there, Tommy. You look at it, he's wheeling it away. That yeah. is, that's a hard impact to rip one of those alloy wheels in, in half almost. For Darren? Forged. Porsche. Yeah, guys, this is this is a similar hit to uh, to the Porsche, the 911 Porsche. It's it, luckily it's isolated to just the the left front corner. It looks more bodywork than anything. It doesn't look like there's any suspension damage. The only reason it came in on the ground like it did was because it had a flat. But they're going to have to repair the bumper. The headlights are busted out. They've got supports broken up underneath. But there's no radiator fluid or anything else leaking. The fr whole front splitter's bust busted off as well. So it, it's going to be a time-consuming repair as well. Mainly bodywork, though. Well, as they go to work on the BMW, let's check in at Risi Competizione with Greg Kramer. Yeah, standing here with Dave Sims and Dave, uh, boy, I'll tell you, the last couple of years, you guys, if you didn't have bad luck, you wouldn't have any luck. And uh, that rebuild after that big hit at Daytona, things look so good here. Any report of anything mechanical or, or any report at all? He, he didn't come back on the radio yet on this one. And especially after yesterday's uh, incident, I mean, the guys rebuilt the car last night, I mean, yesterday, and got up to a really good fast car and um, we we do not know anything yet from the driver um, yeah somewhere along the line we got to change the, some sort of jinx out of out of something um, it's just unreal it is indeed we'll let you get back to it if we find Matteo we'll certainly check in with him when it happened I looked up at Giuseppe and there was almost no reaction it was almost like well of course that's how this season is going and Giancarlo Fisichella just got it well, he said we need to change the jinx, and I had spoken to Giuseppe Ricci a little bit earlier today and said the same thing. Daytona was a jinx. This one appears to be self-inflicted. Oh, no question. You know, and uh, that doesn't make it any easier to take. No, um, no. And in fact, I think it makes it more difficult. Hey, guys, uh, I, I don't have a uh, view to any of the monitors. I would keep an eye on the 56 BMW. They, they taped it back together, and they threw a couple pieces of the, of, of the big strips on there, but it didn't look like all the bodywork was hanging on. So if they don't come back in, I don't know that that thing is going to continue on for very long before they have to come back in. Well, this is also one of the ways we'll see, we'll monitor how you how you manage situations like this. You keep track of the safety car, and you do as much work as you can. Another view of the incident itself. We were lucky the Aston didn't oh, yeah, take yeah. him. I mean, that was almost the second rear end of the of, The of Dempsey the car avoids that bouncing wheel. But what I was saying is they, they, you, what you do is you do as much work as you can, and then you send the car out before the, lead, the, the pace Get car gets there, in. come around again to try to not lose laps. Wow. That's even, that realizes how much, it was even more dramatic yeah, than we realized that how much he came back on the racing line. The exit of turn one, not only is it unsighted, you can't see the exit, you have so much momentum going, even like even when you're by yourself, if you're about to run off the road, you can jerk, jump out of the gas. You can't change your line. There's so much speed and momentum carrying you to the right there that you know you just can't change course. Just gutted that the Reese team is, and I know Giuseppe Reese will not be pleased with this result. You saw the 30 
also with the problem and the right Christina for Nielsen. Real. Yeah. I believe she's the daughter of John Nielsen, the uh, the factory Jag racer from back in the day. I talked to Bo Barfield, who uh, has a pretty big day job as the uh, race director for IndyCar. He's here as the the uh, technician strategist on that 30 car. He said, "I am having such a ball where." My mistakes are not seen by anyone. No. And, in fact, and, it's in full and, camouflage, if you yes. notice what and so, here. But he, he, he talked about their driver lineup, and, uh, and he, he thought they had a really good shot to run well, and now that's all out the window. Well, as the safety crew goes to work, and the, the safety crew has been busy here this year at Sebring, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back to more action from the 60-second running of one of North America's great endurance events, the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. You look down the long back straightaway here at Sebring, the safety car with the lights on. This is our fourth caution. We only had four cautions in 12 hours last year. So you add 63 cars out here. You put 63 cars, I should say, and uh, things get just a little bit busy. Just under nine hours to go. And you look at the big concrete squares. Remember, this is a B-17 training base. That's what this airport facility was originally designed for. And then became a racetrack and when you've seen some of the shots you see the airplanes in the background it is still very much an operational airport and you can see those big square patches of concrete down the front straightaway and it's one of the things that one of the reasons why this racetrack is as rough as it is let's check down in the pits while we have a chance with Greg well Tommy you're talking about Bo Barfield having sort of an off weekend from his full-time job and being team strategist here, this couldn't have been part of the strategy. Uh, at this point, do you know at this stage what the status of the car is? No, they're just getting it back to the uh, back to our camp right now. We're going to assess it, see what we can do to stay in. But uh, I'm sure there's going to be some lengthy repairs. We'll get back going. Well, this is an NGT Motorsport has been in the wars before for sure. Uh, other than this, you've really been enjoying this role, haven't you? Oh, it's been great. This team is really awesome. Momo NGT, the partners they have. Awesome drivers. It's been good for me to get back on the competitor side of things and uh, just had really a great time. Very quickly, I want to move over. Enrique is here, Cisneros, who's team principal and, of course, very involved with the Momo program. 50 years for Momo. This isn't how you wanted that celebration at Sebring to end up, but uh, you've got to be very happy with how things are going other than the incident and, and, and Momo's resurgent in the marketplace. It's largely your guys doing. Yeah, obviously, man, this is our proving ground for, for all the accessories and products we keep coming out with. And, uh, you know, the team, we were running strong. We were running in first place for, for a good part of it. And, um, you know, obviously, the team is disappointed. It's not the ending we wanted. Uh, it's frustrating to see that kind of impatience from a driver so early on. You know, all the field was whizzing by. He had no place trying to, you know, rejoin the pack. And, and he caused two accidents. So, um, you know, it, it, it's too early in the race for that. But, um, again, you know, the team's done a great job. And uh, we'll be back next race. Absolutely, and of course, uh, right here, 1964, 2014, 50 years of Momo. Gentlemen? He was talking to Bo Barfield. I was wondering if Bo Barfield wanted to call a penalty, you know, I mean, since he's race director. Well, he was nice was he, not was getting he, into yeah. trouble. <laughs> Normally when you talk to him, it's, it's because you're accusing him yeah, of yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, she, you had a very good point. She almost missed him even with all that. You know, really a uh, heads up heads up job trying to, to avoid and but. you had a good point Justin when we were in break you were questioning whether there in, in all seriousness whether there will be some type of penalty going forward every other sport you get a yellow card before you get a red card in soccer and things and and I'm not I don't think as a driver it's very easy to drive with a penalty with with probation hanging over your head we have seen it in the last couple of years if without naming names yeah. but we I think it's just it's so easy in the heat of the moment. Only a few lucky ones of us have been in that heat of the battle moment, but again, and, and had to live this, Tommy, like these guys do instant decisions, but also we're professionals, so our instant decisions should be based in in uh, sound judgment. So uh, that was just a bad decision to pull onto the track. Uh, it was a decision to pull onto the track. It, Therefore, it maybe you it was different than driving on the limit in the first mistake, which is the guy's trying. He's leading the race and he's trying to maintain that lead, and he's getting after it, makes a mistake. But this one was an unforced error that you know, uh, just a mistake on top of it. So it's uh, it's a real shame because uh, it affected people other than just him. Well, and the answer is going to be well, he couldn't see back around the corner, and that's when you rely on corner workers 
who will direct you when it is safe to move back onto the racetrack. So all the more reason. Any, any way you look at it, not to pull out yeah, onto any the, way you look at it. It's the one of the you know more pucker puckered up corners uh, you go through. It's yeah. it's thrilling, but it's also dangerous. So it looks like uh, letting the pace car get a little bit ahead. Pull now it's uh, the discretion. There's a zone. A restart zone that Dixon can decide where he wants to go. Does not have near the gap because he does not have cars between him like on the last restart. I was going to say he doesn't have the luxury that he had the last time the green flag flew because right behind him the number five Sebastian Bourdais, then behind him the black number ten Max Angelelli, Michael Valiente, and the blue ninety Corvette, and then the zero one of Memo Rojas. So it's prototypes filling the top six spots on track, at least the top six spots, and maybe the top seven or so. So this is going to be a battle. On board the 0-1 with Mimo Rojas. And those guys up front know each other. Uh, Dixon and Bordet will be going after each other in two weeks on the, the streets of St. Petersburg in their Indy cars. And if you don't think that they give 110% here the way they would in the IndyCar, you are wrong. These guys are competitors, and they are digging every moment. Rojas just Ooh. a little wide at the exit of the hairpin. And they're all over each other right now. So one slip up, one mistake, one inch, and the, and the guy behind is going to try and force his hand. But uh, it's interesting, isn't it, as we watch these DPs they, they, with the prototype right, right up his chuff there as he goes into this very complex sequence. It's... Uh, this for me is all about setting up the guy, this whole sequence. You, you can't really go by anyone here, but it's all about where is the guy fast? I mean, coming down this little straight into this left-right combination before you go down the back straight is very dynamically tough on the car and the driver. So these guys are on the limit here as they come around. But look, Dixon has pulled out a nice little gap. It really gives you a view of where the different type of prototype is strong and where it suffers a little bit. It's David Brabham in the one all over that rear wing of Memo Rojas in front as they come down the long straightaway. You'll get an idea of top speed here. And then right behind them, Gustavo Jakobin in that black and pink number 42 on board the number 90 Corvette. The other thing that we should talk about is in the Corvette ranks, there are different chassis underneath those Corvette skins. The number 90 is a Coyote chassis. That is the 5 and the 9 as well from Action Express or Coyote chassis. The number 10 Corvette from Wayne Taylor Racing has a Delara chassis underneath it. And the Gainesco car, which is not here after that massive impact at Daytona at the Rolex 24, it was a Riley chassis. So when we talk about Corvettes, still different mechanical grip packages underneath because different chassis underneath that Corvette bodywork. A very smooth part of the racetrack actually just here. It's nice, settled down. But the braking zone here is so short going into the very tight hairpin. Until they catch traffic, it's going to give us a good indication of what the relative speeds of these cars are, uh, where their advantages are and so forth. It's really hard to glean that once they get into traffic because lap time is, uh, is usually influenced by how clear their lap was. But the, you know, the P2 car of Brabham there, he cannot hold on the back uh, of Roja. It's it's these DPs are working very well everywhere. And, you know, I think that's, as we're seeing it in the lineup, the top five cars there before, before we get to the P2 car, but and working it, very hard. There's the GTLM cars working their way through, sorting themselves out. And in GT Daytona, where we understand that the 22 from Alex Job Racing will have a stop and hold for 20 seconds for leaving the pit with equipment attached. So for Cooper McNeil, who won in the GTD category last year, they're going to have to work their way back up from a penalty. This GTLM battle, the Corvettes out in front, they had problems. Both cars had problems at the Rolex 24. And I talked to Doug Feehan. It was an overheating issue in the three, a transmission issue in the four. And he said, trust me, we have resolved the issues. They're very confident coming into Sebring. Well, it's funny, because when I was asking Doug Louth about the transmission <laughs> issue, I said, is this different? He says, well, we're always trying to improve, so we're running different parts. And I said, you, so you think you're comfortable? He says, uh, basically he gave me a definite maybe. <laughs> Now let's watch the four as we go down into turn 17. It, you're going to see the bump. Look at the front of the look at the cars in front. You can see them bouncing around as they go. That's an awful lot of driver input as they go through this corner. I mean, you literally are at times, aren't you? Especially as your tires degrade, you're almost swapping hands all over the place. Amazing. And, and you've got an idea of the cornering speed. I'm sorry, Tommy, of, of the number six. That was the six. You saw from Musselman Picket Racing, Klaus Graf. Remember, they did that pit stop. He's got fresh tires, a full load of fuel. He was at the back of the pack, and he is charging. Now you'll see Tommy Milner behind the wheel of the four. Graf going to try to make quick work of him. 
I talked to Ryan Dial and he said with the cornering speed of the P2 car, he said the outside of 17 is actually a passing zone for him. It's a li little bit sketchy, but again, that's such a long corner. If you wait for someone, uh, you lose too much time. So you see obviously Muscle Milk employing the, the same strategy. You notice that the three now with the demise of that Ferrari has uh, that he is now in front of the four car. So he is back on the lead lap. So uh, unless the three car really can't maintain pace, I expect you'll see that four car hold station. So next time we get a yellow, the three will be at the, will get to make that up be at the tail end. Corvette would end up with both of their cars back on the lead lap and you get a good idea of the different speeds there. There's the 31 Corvette, the white and red number 31 Corvette in front of the GTLM Ferrari from Crone Racing and then a, a prototype challenge car right behind them. So you get an idea of how those classes mix together here at Sebring. 63 cars took the green flag. And I, I, I don't think we've seen the full potential of this Corvette. I don't say that because they're holding back. I want to clarify or add to my, my sandbag comments. The reason people, everyone sandbags is because it works. And so, but I, the Corvettes, when before it got real serious at Daytona, both the cars had the problems. The one car was looking pretty good until that late race problem. So I don't think we've seen the full potential of this uh, new C7 Corvette. Gorgeous, gorgeous car. Check in on the prototype challenge leader, Klaus Groff, now working around the 09. Duncan Indy is the leader in the category. And when you look at the pole lap that Bruno Jonquera did in that 09 car from RSR Racing, it was spectacular, like eight tenths of a second in hand. And Bruno obviously, uh you know, used to be with Ganassi, top, top IndyCar guy, found a spot in sports cars, but still a hugely proud, focused individual. And so to be able to throw that kind of a gap on everyone at a track like this, I sent him a congrats message and uh, he was he was reveling in that. Uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot other than on that day, he was head and shoulders above everybody else. Chris Cumming in the team car, the 08 running right behind. So RSR injuries running first and second. And then the 38 in the Prototype Challenge class is right behind them, just behind the Corvette. So the top three in Prototype Challenge running very close together as that 31 Corvette, the Prototype, stuck in between. This for me is the most potentially uh, stressful dynamic of overtaking in, in traffic because you have the PC car that is incredibly nimble and good under brakes. You've got the GT car, LM cars that are actually faster in so many places on this track. And then you have a DP that isn't running as fast as the front runners, uh, uh, slowly going through them. And all you wish for when you're in a traffic situation is that the people around you make a decision, they make it hard and they go through. That was well negotiated by them all. But it's, it's a very, it's, it's not, it's not as, as dynamic and quick as we see at the front end. Well, and when you see, like, when, when Junqueira is in that car, Junqueira is going to be quite a bit quicker than the Corvette. So the fastest, but now when you have guys that maybe aren't quite as quick, you see a part dragon on that 08, one of the uh, the fences on the front splitter. But you, and so it's hard because, you know, the, the Brian Briscoe here in the three, oh. and now we cut away to a, an issue with the 46 Audi. It's Putman like in it's that. down in the hairpin. That's okay. No harm, no foul. It's easy to do that. You just miss your braking by two feet and... And uh, you think you're going to break later, and then you realize that there wasn't. That was late. Well, and for all us old guys, it, it's nice to see that runoff at the hairpin because we, I think we all drove or tested or raced here when there was no runoff no. because that runoff was actually the racetrack. Yeah. One of the fastest entries, hardest brake zones, and the runoff was was about 10 feet and a wall because there's a road behind that. And so uh, when they changed it, I wasn't. I'm like, oh, it's not old Sebring. But now I'm like, well, that was stupid <laughs> that was the smart, way we used yeah. to do it. I think the same person decorated that car that did the villa I'm staying in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can certainly, that is a Florida style car. Madison Snow, he's really come on song, especially last year, winning so many races. And now he is the new leader in GTD. Yeah. We'll also add that Bill Sweedler there, you know, they, they ended up winning Daytona and uh, along with Townsend Bell. And now uh, they're right up at the sharp end of, of the results right here at, uh, at Sebring. So Madison really pushing his way through traffic. And there's the 555 Ferrari. Winner in the GTD category at the Rolex 24. And you were talking about Madison Snow. He won at Petit Le Mans last year. And then he joins Jan Halen in this team. And they had a great finish at the Rolex 24. They joined forces with Matt Plum, put it under the Rum Bum banner. And what else would you expect other than to run up front? Bill Sweedler having a great run. He's taken to this Ferrari 
in this class like gangbusters. He and Townsend Bell having a ball running in this Ferrari now under the AIM banner. And it's happy to see him because a couple years when he was trying to run, he ran that Lotus first and yep. then the privateer Ferrari against the factories in GTLM last year. And uh, it's nice to see him kind of find his level. And he and Townsend, I mean, every session they've been up towards the sharp end of it. Townsend, I went up to Townsend and said, let me see that watch. He says, ah, oh, I'm keeping it in the box, keeping it nice and tidy. So, uh, but for Sweetler, who's invested a lot to actually have a shot to run up front for wins is, is uh, he deserves that for as much as he's uh, contributing to the sport. And the 63 Ferrari there running third in class right now out of the Scuderia Corsa stable. And, and the Ferraris, seem to work so well around this racetrack both in gtd trim and in gt le mans trim well balanced mid-engine easy on tires always quick in a straight line they've got the full package well in, in these classes where you have to have the different ratings of drivers the key the pros are all gold the key is how good are your silvers and uh, there's a lot of uh, effort goes. So Bill Sweetler, who's paying the bills, is uh, is a silver driver. So really, the race in Madison Snow is also a silver driver. So it's uh, the battle amongst the silvers is arguably uh, where where the race is won or lost. And remember when you wanted to be ranked really high? Yeah. Because it made you feel good. Well, now there are guys who haven't been driving for a while who go, well. I know I won some championships, but I think I should be a silver driver because there is a market where for quality your, silver drivers. Your ego gets involved. Last year I was filling out the form and, and it talks about championships and I'm like this and this and this. And I, when I got my platinum ranking, I was like, oh, awesome. And then I'm like, wait a second. I I'm unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a little more humble, you'd be better off. So. We saw how that went for you, Tommy, really. Yeah. Um, so here we are following the 81. Damien Faulkner in that car. He's a really good driver. I've really enjoyed watching him. He's you know, and of course, in this this whole GTD car, the cars are so close. These guys are really going at it. Very important for our viewers to know that doesn't matter what category you're in, you are all, everyone's in as hard a race as they can. And, and winning at Sebring in whatever class is, is as much. We, as we see on the left-hand side of the screen, the 56 BMW, you absolutely called it right from the pits there, Darren, in the fact that it is, they were just patching it up to get it out and patching it up to get it out. But right now they're having to address a slightly more severe problem. You can always tell by the body language when the mechanics start moving slowly, it's not a good sign. No. And now they're working on the opposite side that was not the obviously damaged one. So, um, you know, it's funny. We always talk about, um, hey guys. actually, we're going to go back down to Darren. Hey guys, you're right. This thing, they, they just passed it up to try and get it around for a couple laps and try and buy some time, but this thing was destroyed. The front end, the splitter, the bodywork. Again, all the suspension was fine, but it was rubbing on the tire. Um, it's going to take them a while. And then I look around, I'm coming around to the back of the car, and the back of the bumper's been bashed in. Both of the exhaust pipes are hit. I mean, this thing's been hit front and rear. And you guys know as far as anybody, again, we're not even halfway. And, uh, you just got to stay out of trouble. Unfortunately for Dirk, uh, he wasn't even caught up in the accident. He was trying to avoid the accident. And remember, we talked about it when we listened to Antonio Garcia. It's the 56 that I think he was pushed into after he was hit by the Porsche from behind. So Darren was just talking about the damage to the back of the car. And those little things over time will come back to haunt you. Now, obviously, what haunted the 56 was the problem with Malicelli down in turn one. But that damage, who knows what it would have done. Um, if they'd stayed out on track and not been repairing the front end of the car right now. And we see that Oak Racing car, Gustavo Jakobin behind the wheel, has pulled himself up to the tail end of this battle between Rojas and Brabham. And that Oak car was did not have the speed, but somehow maintained, stayed in contention till the very end of the Rolex 24. They've a uh, hugely experienced, successful team from Europe, uh, the winner in P2 at Le Mans last year. The 0-2 is in. It looks like a driver change, Andrew. With, with Oak, Oak Racing, of course, they had an alternator problem at Daytona, and that cost them a lot. But that car was really quick there. I've just been talking to the team a minute ago, and uh, you know, I was a bit concerned. They didn't seem to have the pace that they had in qualifying in the early part of the race. That just to explain that they sort of got themselves out of position, really, and they got a lot of dirt on the tires after that uh, last big incident so uh, i think you might see the oak car coming up through the field but remember this is their old car just last week alex uh, alex brundle tested their new coupe and that, that coupe there'll be a couple of those under the Ligier name which will be racing at le mans so i think there's a lot more to come from boat racing down to you chris up to the boot 
We've had a, another problem on the racetrack, one of the prototype challenge cars in the tire wall. And notice this tire wall, not like the wall down in 17 or in one when Malicelli got into it, doesn't have the big rubber wrap on it. It's loose bundles, and you can see how those get pushed up and out of the way. That's quite a journey he made to get out there. Um, you're actually at the midpoint of that corner, you're going quite slowly. I mean, you know, you roll through it, but uh, if you notice, it doesn't look like a lot of brake marks there, Tommy. Did something happen? It looks like it just rolled straight in there. Well, it's possible he got shoved off during the brake zone before he had the speed off, and uh, you see he pretty much straight in there. Yeah, it's not fun when you're in an open top car and you're in a bunch of tires because they're easy to get hit in the, in the head there. But it does bring out another full course caution, which is a real pity because this race was just getting a nice rhythm going. We started to see the classes sorting themselves out. And I'm sure the strategies were starting to be able to plan what the next eight hours, 37 minutes was going to look like. I see a little movement, his head moving a little, and I saw a hand there, but I'm, I'm a little surprised we don't at least have a corner worker over there getting eyes on him. Uh, full course caution. And this has not been a good day for Bar One Motorsports. They had problems with the 88 and the 87 earlier, if you remember when we were talking about Tommy Dreese. So, uh, not the day that they wanted to have, but teams are going to take the opportunity to get some pit stops done. These cars obviously, uh, well, hopefully committed uh, long pit well, lane. Hopefully say, they I, committed I, before. And this is often something that happens. Uh, so, Mary. Velocity here just uh, unplugging all the various pieces of equipment and I've just got to be pushed out of the way here as the BMW is going. Do you hear that? Look at that. Got the smoke up my nose again, that rubber smoke. I told you it's a drug before. So <laughs> good pit stop there from the uh, Wade Taylor boys. And uh, just going to try and uh, catch up with Bobby Rahal in a minute to find out what's been going on with that BMW. I think they've got it sorted now. Well, Tommy just pointed it out and I, I sounded a little confused when they were rolling down pit lane because the caution was out and It'll be interesting to see if they came down pit road because if pits were closed, they can't service the car other than emergency service, which means if the car were nearly out of fuel, they could give it a splash. But Chances they did more than emergency service. And I think since those cars are both at the very end of the pit lane, uh, it takes a good while to get down there. So I'm guessing they did. It was just heads up work by both Action Express. The Action Express car was in and out, and also the yeah. Taylor car was in. What you do is you see an incident. Look at this. Oh, the, the 56. 56 trying to get back around. What you do is if you, you see an incident and you, and you think there's a good chance they're going to call a yellow, you commit to the pits before the yellow comes on, and now everybody else that pits under this yellow will then cycle out behind yeah. them. You'll end up with an advantage. It's just good heads up work uh, if you, you know, you're taking a gamble if, uh, but, but it looks like it'll pay off assuming they were in before the pits were closed. While we're full course caution, let's check in with Chris Neville who's down at Corvette. Yeah, we were watching the BMW guys trying to get that car back on the racetrack. In the first hour of this race, it was the three car damage there and you guys getting back out. You lost a lap, but finally now after a couple hours, it looks like with this caution, you might get back on the lead lap. Yeah. Well, it looks like, uh, we'll see, I'm not sure that it, uh, enough time has passed since the last yellow, but it looks like we'll get it back, which is good. The car is good after, uh, after we fixed it. It seems uh, it's a fast car, so. Is it 100%? I think so. I think it's back to 100%. All right, you've obviously got a lot on your mind this weekend. Your son, Kevin, competing in his first Formula One race. He qualified fourth. Is any of that a distraction? Yes. <laughs> A huge distraction, but uh, no, you know, all his stuff is when I'm not doing my stuff, so that's good. I can concentrate on my own, and then when we're done here tonight, go back to the to the condo and watch his race. Do you wish you were there and you could give him any advice? Yes, of course I wish I was there, but uh, that's how it is. Uh, I'll go to the next one, and uh, but I'm, I'm so happy for Kevin. Uh, his performance yesterday was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, everybody down here at Corvette says, this weekend, Yan is just going to be known as Kevin's dad. <laughs> well, he says he wishes he was there, but you told me that he went to a race last year and had never been so nervous in his life, never got that scared in a race car. I guess sitting watching your son drive something of, of that caliber is just a little bit nerve-wracking. They've gotten the 87 out of the tire wall, and he'll make his way back around. Bruce Hamilton, as I said, not the day they wanted to have down at bar one. The good thing is they, I mean, they should replace those tires pretty quickly and, and get this thing back underway. Um, but, you know, I he's... Mean, look at the front of the car, it's clean. Yeah, yeah. it really is. He, and so I said, I don't think his impact was very hard, but 
they do by regulation have to put that tire wall back in in proper shape um and uh as we, as we know, this is the second race of the year. So, I mean, that's what we have to remember, guys. Think about it. When people go back and talk about racing history, this is the second race of the Tudor Sports yeah. Car Series. Second race second in race history. In history. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty big one. You add that to 62 years of history. Uh, so it's new in, in the old. Well, I think, too, you know, I, I, there are... You know, the line is haters going to hate, you know, and, and I know that there was times after the Rolex 24 when people complained about this, that or the other. But when I look at what the series has done, taking two separate entities, putting them together and what they've built, it's pretty impressive, especially when you look at the balance of performance of the cars here this weekend. Impressive stuff. Let's check that back down in the pits with Darren. Hey, guys, you might want to check in at some point uh, throughout the, the rest of the race here with the nine car from Action Express. Brian Frizzell got sick in the car. They had to pull him out, and they're checking him out. They don't know if it's food poisoning or heat or what, uh, and it's a possibility they might be down to just two drivers if he can't make it back. Hey, you don't want that because you got to make sure that you've got some fresh drivers in the car, and, and it's one of those things that, you know, people talk about what a driver goes through. But the danger is, and a lot of times I don't think fans see it, the danger is you leave your driver in for too long, they get worn out. With the speeds they're going and the physical abuse that they take around this racetrack, you become prone to making mistakes. On top of that, from a strategic standpoint, it becomes an issue because you can only leave your driver in the car for so long over a certain period of time. So drive time becomes a bit of a sticking point unless you play your strategy just right. And if you've only got two bullets left in the gun for the rest of the race, that's going to be an issue. It'd be really easy to follow a foul of that uh, four hours within any six hours. Uh... I wonder if they're talking about pit lane. I, that's exactly what well, I think they're the talking about. I yeah. just thought I overheard we were committed. Yep. So, I think they're having that, that conversation. Would be the word. Well, then the other one said it wasn't committed, and then... Let's listen. Well, did, did you, did you, it was called up. Who called it? Did Chuck, you call Chuck, it? Chuck, Chuck. Yeah. But they haven't called over the radio. They haven't yet. called it, so just stand down until they, they, they call over the radio. Okay. Yeah, well, no, they, Chuck called Well, it, Wayne, there's a big conversation going down here. I mean, you just told me before we came uh, onto this interview that your car was committed. What's the situation? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we were committed before the caution came out, and we can't see where he's on the track once he's committed. And if there was a yellow flag at that point, they should have notified us. Uh, notified us. They didn't. We were already, we were, we were already committed. So uh, you're still arguing it out, are you? I'm not sure where really he's arguing. I think he's he's trying to get the right decision. Yeah. So uh, long way to go in this race. You're right in the hunt. Yeah, it's a long way to go. But you know, you don't want to have this kind of unnecessary uh, thing happen at this early stage because you you can get taken out just so easy by, by slower traffic. So you want to get yourself with, with the quicker cars. Quick question, Wayne. You had your one session at Daytona. You said you're never going in a race car again. Have you put, put the crash helmet and the race suit in the museum? In my home museum, all hung up, ready to go. All ready for photographs. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, well, the controversy rages down here at the Wayne Taylor pit. Not for the first time, mates. You hear him continuing to talk to the officials. They were talking about being committed. If he was already at pit in and there was no way to stay out, that's committed. Deciding that you're going to make a pit stop coming through turn 16 at the beginning of the back straightaway, the team may be committed, but that doesn't mean. That reminds me of that. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's, that's a pretty tough yeah, call. That's a very big orange light, isn't it? Tommy? Yeah. Before I saw uh, that, <laughs> before I saw that, I was thinking they weren't terribly emphatic in their defense, yeah. but uh, I'd, have, I'd have pleaded a little harder on that. Yeah, well, we will find out as they continue to try to figure out what to do with the 10 car. They plead their case. We'll be back to Sebring right after this. Back at Sebring International Raceway, still under full course caution and a little bit of controversy on pit lane as uh, the number 10 car from Wayne Taylor Racing, Max Angelelli behind the wheel. Discussion about whether he came to pit lane after the pit lane was closed. I think there might have been a little question as to whether Sebastian Bourdais and the number five from Action Express might have come down pit road when it was closed as well, but they came in 10 seconds apart. So if they get the five, they're certainly gonna get the 10, but uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, committed on the 10 car. Uh, he was about as committed as that guy on that Bachelor show while he's dating 15 different women. Yeah, I mean, that's the five I mean, it's rolling clearly, that's Bourdais. The light it's is a certainly closer on. call on Bourdais, yeah. for sure. That was a team's call to tell him not to enter at that point because you are on the inside. You you would only have to be careful of the traffic on the outside of you there. If it was in a big pack, you really wouldn't want to to rejoin in the middle of that pack, Tommy, but we can't see that from the camera angle. So. Well, he could have gone on, and there's enough room because uh, the racing line takes you way out yeah. uh, towards the wall. So if he would have just peeled just on, just to the left of that uh, the split, he could have been okay there. But, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's your, th they were taking that gamble if they get in and get away with it, it helps them. I mean, they were already at the front of the field, so it really there wasn't that much to be gained. I um, mean, the, the interesting thing, are the, are the five did probably get in just in front of the light, but we don't know. That would have been more a case of committed because yeah. I think the timing would have been tighter there. But obviously, as we watch the cars go around, well, for me, Tommy, with what's happening right now, you must be coming up with some quite significant driver changes, I think, as well. We are now, uh, well, three and a half hours just over in this race. And we're actually uh, on on the in the heat of the day. I think it's starting to wear people down quite a lot. And uh, as we watch the ten there on track, I think Andrew is down with the five car. Yes, Justin. In fact, I've just hopped back over the wall. They tell me they are definitely clean. The officials did uh, come up to them, but there is no problem. They are convinced they will not get a penalty, and I'm sure that's the situation. So uh, they are clean and. Uh, well, they were just the right side of that cut, I think. Yeah, I, I think you may be right, Andrew. And for Max Angelelli, it's going to be frustrating because he sees the five right in front of him, and he saw the five rolling down pit road right in front of him, and he's going to be going, well, all right, well, what about him? But as as you said, when you look at the light, and if you look at the, the timing beacon, it was 10 seconds after the five crossed the line at pit end that the 10 rolled down pit road. And well, that's really a better move if you're back in fifth or sixth. It's worth taking the gamble. They were already, they weren't leading. They were already right at the front. So it's, uh, I mean, obviously hindsight's 2020, but um, you know, that ultimately, that decision ultimately rests with the driver because he knows where he is and he sees where the light comes on. I mean, as Wayne said, Rain just had this look on his face. He knows it isn't all over because yeah. if you get a penalty, because you've got eight and a half, but it just makes it harder work. Yeah. You have to get a pass by, you have to wave by in, in another next yellow, and you have to work your way back up to the front, but it's a lot easier to be, stay at the sharp end. The 60-second running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. We're back, and it is a beautiful day in sunny central florida and there's been plenty of action since the drop of the green full course cash in right now so we'll give you a little bit of a race recap and with 63 cars starting a lot of people looked for fireworks right from the get-go first couple of laps were clean but then as we said earlier things heated up this actually took place under caution clearly a fuel uh, issue fuel leak that's fueling this fire even when they put it out it keeps springing back up just a shame the car was running second at the time the only good news about the fire was the driver Ben Keating was out, but then issues for the number three Corvette. Issues, Corvette responded well, as fast as they could, but as we later heard from Jan Magnussen, it's gonna take a long time to catch that one back up. Problems all around the racetrack as the day heated up and perhaps some fluid down on the racetrack because we had five or six cars off at a time. Damage to the winners in the GTLM category from the Rolex 24. You saw that 911 Porsche with contact with a prototype challenge. A little stall for Klaus Groff leading the pit lane. After one of his stops, he would have to serve a penalty as well for speeding on pit road. And then the big one. Yeah, that was an initially, yeah, he went in hard, the car's still movable, but this next move pulling into the direct line of traffic resulted in two cars being taken out of this race for the rest of it a uh, very very disappointing move by the driver and of course then the bmw the 56 bmw that front left hand corner absolutely wiped out now that i see that again we never saw where that car got damaged no, it happened at the same time so um we're gonna maybe have to investigate that a little bit further to see where that damage suffered it's that uh, bmw suffered its damage but Matteo Malicelli in that number 62 Ferrari pulling back out on track, it could have been much worse than it was, and that was just such a dangerous spot. So that's the race recap. Here is a look at the unofficial prototype class standings. The number five up front, Sebastian Bourdais, has been magic. 
as the third driver in that car with Christian Fittipaldi and Joao Barbosa all weekend long. Great job in qualifying just behind him. The number 10 from Wayne Taylor Racing, Jordan Taylor, Max Angelelli, and Ricky Taylor. But there is a potential penalty that might be coming their way for coming to pit road during this full course caution when pit lane was closed. GT Le Mans category is one that we always talk about where the manufacturers like to play. And right now, Corvette trying to make up for the problems that they had the Rolex 24. They lead in category. Well, but, you know, the, just the endless problems. And you hear people talk about how Sebring 12 hours here is like 36 elsewhere. And you're like, is that a hyperbole? Look at what's happened between that Ferrari going out, the, the flawless uh, factory Porsche having trouble one of the Corvettes, BMW, et cetera, and, and that's just in one class. And here we go to GT Daytona. Rum bum up front. Yan Halen, Matt Plum, Madison Snow, Hugh Plum. Remember, Yan Halen, Madison Snow drove together at the Rolex 24, finished third. They joined forces with Rum bum, Matt Plum, and Hugh Plum here at Sebring. And you know what? They haven't skipped a beat. Just been rocket ship fast all week long. And in the prototype challenge category, Number 25 from 8 Star Motorsports running up front right now, but that's been a seesaw battle back and forth. And the way a lot of this just comes down to pit stops yep. and so forth. Uh, this class, it, you can always you can throw a blanket over the top cars, uh, almost virtually in every class. But uh, that one seems to be, it's hard to even begin to handicap it until you get well closer to the end of this one. 63 cars took the green flag, so it is definitely congested here on the Sebring International Racetrack, and that has made for some great racing. There is plenty more to come from the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Welcome back live to Sebring International Raceway as we continue with our Fox Sports coverage here, live streaming at IMSA.com and Fox Sports Go. And thanks to Brian Till, Justin Bell, and Tommy Kendall. Now on the mic in the booth, I'm Bob Varsha along with Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. We are under our fifth caution flag. We've already broken last year's mark for caution with the number of laps and number of yellow flags. And what has been a fairly bizarre race, even by Sebring standards to this point, Dorsey? Well, we turned the microphone over to our cohorts and look what they do. It tore everything up. Yeah, this is pretty amazing that they uh, we've had this many cautions and and the degree of which we've had them too, for that matter. I mean, that big fire to start the things off, you can't do much about that, but. You know, the Risi Competizione, Ferrari, another huge wreck for those guys mm -hmm. after the thing that they went through at Daytona. You know, it's, just, it's saddening. Yeah, I mean, uh, Giuseppe Risi just can't catch a break. I mean, the poor guy just keeps digging deep and coming back, but um, they need to uh, get out of this jinx that they're under. But I think it's really tough for everyone up and down pit lane right now because the race has no rhythm. Mm -hmm. They probably don't have really have good fuel mileage numbers yet and things like that. So at this stage of the game, you start to lay out your game plan, but I'm not sure anyone's even got that together yet. It's disjointed for sure. I mean, there's no rhythm to the race. There's no... You know, that you can't get good numbers on things. We're going into the heat of the day, which is uh, the slipperiest part of the day as far as the racetrack goes. Working the pit lane with us now is Andrew Marriott and the man standing by right now with the boss over at Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. Here's Chris Neville. Yeah, Bob, Mike Hall calling the shots on the O2 car this weekend. And Mike, we were just talking about rhythm of this race and all these cautions. Is it kind of tough to pull, pull a strategy together when we keep going under caution? Uh, <laughs> Well, it seems like some days the cautions fall for you, some days they don't. But I think if, if there were 30 minutes to go in the race, we'd be having a different conversation. Uh, but, you know, we, it, the, it, the balance is maturity and experience. Uh, it's great when you're up front with the experience. It's really good to have maturity when you're not. So uh, a long way to go, but it's great to be racing at Sebring. That's, that's really the main thing. You know, in the early part of this race, it looked like the Corvettes were strong. They stayed up front, and then you guys got the lead, and you were able to keep it. Is it just being up front, being able to control that pace? No, I think what you're seeing is a product of a lot of hard work from the Ford people here on this side. Uh, what we've done since the 24 hours at uh, Daytona is equalize ourselves to the Corvettes. And so now I think you're going to see a race here, uh, particularly when it gets late at night. I hope everybody decides to tune us in on Fox tonight because I think they'll see a heck of a show when the headlights come up. You know, one car pitted right next to you. Lots of communication back and forth. Does that car have the pace of the O2 car? I think they both have pace. The great thing about communication when you have teammates is the fact that you learn from each other and you read the road. That's really what you learn. When you're, when you're out there on that Gilligan's Island and you don't know what's going on, you can't exactly run down the road and ask the Corvettes what they're doing. So it really helps a lot. 
Well, Scott Dixon was behind the wheel for quite a few hours since the top drop of the green. Now we've got rookie Sage Karam out there. Andrew? Yeah, well, I'm with Mike Rockefeller here in the 90 uh, Spirit of Daytona car. And uh, don't quite seem to have the pace rocket at the moment, but the race really hasn't gone away. Yeah, I mean, it's so many yellows so far, you know. It's just uh, you have to be clean and try to stay on track, out of trouble. That's what we are doing so far. We haven't shown uh, the best pace, I would say, today. But we are, we are up there. We are P7 currently, and it's still a long race. And uh, I hope the, the car will get better, you know, as the track grips up and uh, it's quite hot now so we are playing with tire pressures and see what we can do. Rocket reigning DTM champion, I wonder what a DTM car would be like around here? Yeah, I would love to try it, you know, but uh, for sure it would be great fun. Well, you'll be defending that title, of course. That's uh, always the goal. <laughs> very good. Thanks. Doing that with Phoenix Racing, uh, back to you. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. I'd like that too. DTM cars around here? I bet that would be a show. Uh, they run those things pretty stiff, though. I mean, yeah. uh, it would be a rock and roll show through turn 17, that's for sure. Knock that's Michael Valiente. Knock your feelings out. <laughs> Michael's going to be running full-time with Richard Westbrook this year in the sprint races. Obviously, Rocky's just in for Daytona, Sebring, and Petit. A really strong driver line up there this year. And uh, struggled a little bit early in the week. Spoke to Westy during the lunch break, and he said the car was not good in qualifying. They made some changes. He said it felt much better in his opening stint. So they put the top down of the Corvette Stingray convertible pace car, exactly what I would do. Now to something that I won't do. Race Corvettes at Sebring. Sebastian Bourdais, Max Angelelli, followed by Sage Karam, David Brabham, Memo Rojas, your top five. Look at Sage Karam, he jinks around the outside of Angelelli and takes back that second position. Boy, oh boy, the Indy Lights champion is on it. Max went to the inside, he got on the brakes and the car was in the bumps and started hopping up and down. I don't think he realized it was that rough over there. The Ganassi squad have been very impressed with the pace of this young man who's behind the wheel of the O2 right now and he is showing his stuff. I had a long chat with the man you just heard from, Mike Hull, about Sage Karam at the recent test leading into this year's 12 hours. And you're right, Calvin, they are very impressed with what this kid can do. See how bumpy it is right there going in the hairpin? That was that, This racetrack has settled in, and it's, it's created all these bumps. It didn't used to be there when they paved this some years back. Look at this. Look he at him. wants the man. lead. He wants it now. He is pushing hard. He's down the inside. Bordeaux will let him have it. He doesn't want to fight too hard. You see how rough it was when he got offline. He pushed him all the oh, way to the grass. He oh, is that is up. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that was really, really looser there. Remember, at four hours, there's going to be those uh, endurance points awarded. So we're 11 minutes from that mark. That might be why they've let him loose. Sage Karam from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, home of the legendary Andretti family of racers. And there must be something in the water in Nazareth. Trone North American Endurance Cup. That's very much a part of these first two championship rounds. This is going to be devastating. The 10 is getting a penalty, guys, and it's going to be a big one. Stop and hold for 60 seconds. Seems like the Action Express car, they've said, you're OK. They pitted exactly 10 seconds apart from one another, so they're saying that the Action Express was committed to pit lane but Angelelli Stayed had out. the option to stay out and he didn't. So that was a big gamble. One other car was also nicked. The Bar One Motorsports PC, Orica Chevrolet of Bruce Hamilton, Gaston Kirby, and Tonus Kazimets. They have been off and on the track all day. Oh, trouble here, 38's 38. back into the wall. Not bad, I don't think it's hurt the car. They it's just fell behind the wheel. Yeah, that's down in 17, right before you come on pit lane. So if he did hurt the car, he's right close to get in, but. I think he just had a simple spin and uh, rolled back into the wall the way it looks. So really surprised that the amount of spins by the LMPC cars where, you know, I know some of it has been contact and just, you know, a lot of traffic situations, but there seems to have been some simple spins going on with drivers by themselves. Well, that was a spin early, early in the corner. I think he got caught yeah. off by that uh, BMW possibly. Oh, he did bend the wing in a little bit though, didn't he? Maybe he just had to jump on the brakes a little bit harder, hit a bump and got turned around on that approach to 17. It's young Canadian David Ostella, who has driven two, count them, two long endurance races in his career. He won here in class last year and finished on the podium in January at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Traffic jam, Sebring. WeatherTech car in white and black trim in the middle of this gaggle. 
Looks like one of the Porsches dragging something off the left rear, unless it's just some loose body work, possibly. The blue car there. I don't think it's any problem. Back on board the 22. Rum Bum up ahead. Fox Q911, this is the factory GTLM car. It's a car that's kind of trying to bounce back a little bit, had some uh, problems a couple of hours ago. Car that won at Daytona, of course, in that fantastic battle with the BMW car in the last hour. See him flashing the lights. He's trying to make up ground, like you said, Cal. Driving a lot more aggressively than some of these guys around him want to do right now. What you're doing by that, you're just alerting one of those GTD machines who's in the thick of their own battle. This will focus forward. You sometimes don't look in your rearview mirrors and see that faster GTLM car coming behind you. This is Richard Leitz in the Porsche for the speed differential over the GTT cars on the straightaway. Surprising, it's not that much in straightaway. It would be a lot more up here in the brake zone. Yeah, the GTLM just has so much more downforce, which creates da drag down the straightaways, but then in the brake zones, Dorsey, as you said, that then gives you grip on the entry to the corner. Road racing is a give and take proposition. If you've got the faster car, you expect guys to get out of the way, but it's not always easy. Those guys also realize that they have pace in certain parts of the racetrack, so that they don't want to slow down to let you by. They don't want to ruin their lap time. They are more than willing to say, you're just going to have to bide your time and wait. Look at Sage, man. He's just setting sail. Whoa, big hop there. And again, those bonus points for the North American Endurance Cup are awarded at the four-hour mark, the eight-hour mark, and at the checkered flag. Here we go. Wow, he's out there no man's land getting around Bourdais. I'm sure Bourdais didn't even expect that. He was almost off the racetrack totally there. You see there, sometimes when you're on a line that you normally don't work on, you suddenly find a big bump you didn't even know was there. <laughs> Watch hey, that, right you there. see that? Yeah. Right there. You don't normally drive on that right-hand side of the road, and he had a big bump to deal with. There you see the gap now, about plus five car lengths. Stop plus 60. Here comes the penalty, stop plus it's 60. Talking to the 10. Mm, he'll be fuming. See if he peels off. Damn, yes, he hit does. This lap, hit this lap. Just coming down pit lane versus Sunday staying on the racetrack. Max wants to know what he did. Pit, the penalty box is on the right side of pit out. Go all the way to the end of the pit. Stop in the box on the right hand side. Did I do, did I do something wrong? I want to learn. Tell me. This is why you can see the yellow light flashing. That means pit lane is closed. Bordet, the leader, had hit pit lane before that had come on. Angelelli did not. Earlier you heard as Brian, JB, and if Tommy. I did something wrong, tell me, I want to learn. There was a we'll long- talk about it after the penalty here. There was a long conversation with officials about whether or not he was committed to the pit lane when the previous yellow flag came out. Apparently, they lost the argument. It's not you, Max. We made a mistake up here. It's not you. Yeah, they called okay. him. Okay, okay. Thanks. That's uh, pretty level-headed right there. I mean, he said, if I made a mistake, I want to learn. I want to know what I did wrong. I don't, I'm not understanding it. And, well, they said pit, pit, obviously, yeah, but they the did. driver they still has to realize that when the light comes on, I'm not allowed to pit. So yeah. there's, a, there's a gray area there. You listen to your pits, though, don't you? I mean, they, they tell you to come in, and you're, you're more concentrating on getting getting the pit stop done quickly than that light coming on. Well, the call was the right one. If you can get in and beat that yellow you light, then you get a big it. advantage. But, you know, the driver's the one who's going to see when the light comes on and whether you beat the light, so to speak. But just coming down pit lane alone without serving the penalty costs you about 35, 37 push seconds. Here. Push hard. We need to stay on the lead lap. The leaders will be right on you. Push hard. All right, the damage has been done. The penalty is served. Max the Axe is back in action. Let's go to Chris Neville. Well, Patrick Dempsey finally cooling off after almost two hours behind the wheel. But Patrick, after you did the exchange, the car came back in pit lane and they were adding some fluid. What's going on with the Porsche? Yeah, we've been struggling with the power steering pretty much uh, halfway through Andrew's first stint there. And then I got in the car, we put some fluid in it. It helped for like four or five laps. And then that was it. So it's a little bit of a workout. So two hours behind the wheel, no power steering. No, it reminded me of everybody in the old days. You know, that nobody had power steering. I've been training a lot, which made a big difference. 
And uh, just, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, Beautyrest has been supporting us and uh, pushing the design and uh, specialize all our sponsors, Motegi Wheels. It's just, it's unfortunate we're not a better result. We, we had a good shot at it. We'll just have to battle back and see. We still got a long, long way to go. We do, and every time we drop back and take a look at GTD, it seems like we just have clusters of cars everywhere, so you're constantly battling. Oh, it's a blast. There's so much going on. It really is situational awareness, managing traffic, you know, understanding what the LMPC guys are going to do, and battling it out in your class. It's, it's just fantastic. It was an incident in one. I didn't know if I was going to make it through. The tire flips up and just hit the front quarter panel, and then we kept going. I was like, I've got by that one. It's a blast. I'm having a blast. Why don't you go do some curls and really try and burn those arms up? <laughs> I will. Patrick Dempsey not only enjoys his racing, he's a huge student of the sport, a big respecter of the traditions here at Sebring. I hope you heard his discussion with our Justin Bell during our half-hour pre-race show here at IMSA.com. You'll have one of those before every round of the championship this year. Again, you see the clock winding down at the top of the screen. In just over three minutes, there'll be bonus points awarded for the Patron North American Endurance Cup. And a lot of guys will be strategizing around that, looking at the Viper team that currently leads in GTLM. Looks like they decide to keep Dominic Farnbacher out there. He uh, doesn't have a lot of time left in terms of fuel in his tank, but uh, he may be able to stretch it and get enough to get across the eight-hour mark to go. Battle for second in GTD. The 63 Porsche of Alessandro Balzan. Excuse me, the Ferrari 458 Italia. How could I make that mistake? And Marco Seafried in the number 44 Magnus Racing Porsche. 44 car rebounding. They had a problem early in the race when uh, John Potter got took for a ride over in turn 13. Had a little bit of damage, but they've got a really good group on their pit wall as well. And you can strategize, strategize your way back in to the mix. You just got to stay calm work the rules in terms of the safety cars and uh, you can be back in the mix very easily. Yeah, sure wasn't John Potter's fault either. I mean, he was just innocent bystander. He got run through from behind and they're doing a good job. That team pulling back in. Aboard the 22. And fifth in class. Going to see some names here you may not have uh, seen before in North American sports car racing because a lot of these teams have had to dig deep into the driver pool to find these pro-am drivers, guys who are graded as silver. If you're running one gold in the pro-am categories, you only need to have, um, you, well, you need two drivers with silver grading, but only one needs to do the minimum drive time. If you have two goals in your car, you got to have two good guys with silver status to do the minimum drive time, which is two hours and 50 minutes. So that's like 25% of the race almost. So you can't afford to have someone who's going to lose you too much ground. So these guys have been pouring through uh, driver resumes, trying to find guys who have speed, but have been on the radar, under the radar, so to speak, in terms of having a goal status, which would eliminate them. That's an interesting ripple in the driver market. Somebody who's good, but not so experienced. As we say, silver drivers, good silver driver is golden. <laughs> Great battle in GTD here including a couple of Audis. We haven't talked much about the R8. Of course, Audi, oh, whoa, whoa. was that a that tap? Was a got a tap. Yeah, yeah. I, think it, I think it did get tapped. He may have a problem. Not getting back yeah, down. Yeah, he got flat left, left rear. Yeah. Down. That's what the noise was. You heard the tire the blow. Yeah. yeah. And he's got a long way to go. Yes, he does. That's about two miles to go, I would say. It's Alessandro Latif switched over from the sister car. Well, we've got a race at the front for the overall. Yeah, look at, the, look at the time on the clock. We keep talking about those bonus points. Yeah. It is go time if you got anything. And Ian Watt is very much on top of the strategy. They did it very well last year to be in the mix in the uh, North American Endurance Championship. 20 yes. seconds, traffic ahead. This is for the points at the one-third mark of this Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring with points toward the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Championship. It's a double-edged sword. How much do you push for those bonus points and risk throwing it all away here? in terms of getting any damage or getting involved. Sage Karam is a very aggressive driver. Remember, you've got to cross the line. We're at that eight hour mark, but they've got to get to the stripe to get those bonus oh, points. Really Doesn't fight. count right now. The Mazda held up. Oh, oh there wow. goes Latif around. That Trying really to... helped out the O2 car. I think Sage is going to be well clear of any pressure from Bordet down into 17. He spins yeah, the car yeah. back around at the top of your screen. It's still right in the middle of the racing line. 
Now he might get held up through here. Through the blind bridge turn. Nope, he'll go inside. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That Porsche better see him. Woo. Trouble is, as you start getting on the gas early, that front just takes off on you and washes out into that traffic. There we go. They should have got those bonus points right at that mark for the Ganassi squad. We need a special kind of flag for one of the stages in the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup. So everybody knows, including the spectators. And this yeah, point's really awarded nice. in all four classes. Everyone's up. There's $100,000 on the line for the prototype division and the GTLM, and then 50000 awarded to LMPC and GTD at the end of the year. It's a nice bonus. He's going to make it in the pit lane with that without too much damage. Did a little bit on that left rear fender, but not really nothing to worry about. I don't think even arrow is going to be affected. It doesn't look like he damaged the car much. No, just right behind where it's flopping. But I don't think I will hinder its performance at all. Spoke to Tommy Sadler this morning right after the warm-up, and he said uh, Marcus Winklehawk actually tweaked a nerve in his back during a practice driver change this morning, so they weren't sure how much uh, time he was going to do for the squad here today, and uh, he was obviously the guy in the middle of that battle at the end of the Daytona 24-hour race, so you don't want to lose someone with that sort of talent with having an injury. Audi, of course, dominated here with their prototype cars in the old American Le Mans series. Taking overall victory after overall victory. They were just here testing a couple weeks back for the 24-hour uh, Le Mans. Use yep. this track as a test track. Big believers that Sebring is the ultimate test track. If you could survive here, you could survive anywhere. That's not a cheap adventure, no, bringing over the prototypes for a week. They're doing night testing and everything. I saw Tom Christensen in Orlando last week before he flew back to Europe, and he said, we had a great test. We feel like we're in good shape. But he said, not everyone is showing their hand yet. But as they say, this is the ultimate test bed. You had a quick glimpse of a neat tradition here at Sebring. There you go, the nationality, the winning car, and the year in which they triumph. Now notice all the familiar names. There are Ford, GT40, Porsche for their 908s and so forth, the Ferrari 512, what have you. You get down up into the 90s and the 2000 decade, and you see a lot of German flags. Those, of course, for Porsche, still one of the most successful brands here wow. at Sebring. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, go for, it went for a long it's going time. Going and going. And eventually it'll become Audi. Well, the Japanese got in here too. Yeah, you're going to see some Nissans. Nissan and, there you go. and Toyota pop in here. The great days of the Camel GT. Jeff Brabham, who was here this weekend, his son Matt Brabham was awarded the John Gores Line sponsorship to a young driver. Jeff was a four time endurance champion here in what is now the IMSA. Tudor United Sports Car Championship, but look at all those German flags and all those Audis. 2008 Porsche snuck in there, remember that P2 Spider? It was yeah, a great yeah. battle. They actually won overall with the P2 car over the dominant Audis. All right, Penske Racing, who else brought it here and led the way? On board the 45, there goes the GTLM's Viper, Corvette. Cold tires still, you know, we saw the flat tire, so he's taking four, I'm sure. It'll take a lap to get those up to temp. And so he's a sitting duck at this point. Yeah, pretty much getting passed up there through Gurney Bend, headed toward the hairpin at turn seven. You just got to be patient, Calvin, just like you were talking about before. I mean, you go out in these conditions, you can just drive as hard as you can. Till you get those temperatures and pressures up, though, I mean, you, you're not up to speed. There's nothing you can do about it. Dane Cameron. In the class leading BMW Z4, Andrew Marriott is with his boss. I certainly am with Will Turner. Will, uh, what a story this is. You had a bit of a problem before the start. You had to start from the pit lane, and now you're leading. Yeah, so leading after four hours isn't really that important. It's not when I want to lead. I want to lead at the end of this race. Uh, yeah, but you've just got some points, haven't you, in the Yeah, we just got some valuable points for the championship. And I have to thank Don Salama for planning that because um, his strategy worked out well to get Dane to the front. But also, Dane's doing a fantastic job in his BMW. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, right now he's uh, the class of uh, four hours, so that's good. But uh, again, it's not over till it's over. Teams struggled with some ups and downs this weekend. I got to thank all the guys for the hard work and uh, Paul Dallalana for, uh, for making this happen. And uh, he had a fantastic stint. 
So we're just going to hope uh, that everything works out. Oh, see where massive we are wreck. In, uh, big wreck. I think this has been a big hit, so I'll go back to the booth. This is a big one, guys. I don't know where that oh. car on the straightaway is, but that's a, that hit a ton. Really bad hit. Car on the right, heavily damaged. Car on the left. Wow. Our sixth full course caution. And our second major accident. That is so fast through there. You're, you're just really, really on the throttle hard. And there obviously has been contact. There's two cars involved here. Number 38. Most heavily damaged car. The prototype challenge machine of David Ostella. And there's the 52, the other car involved. The 52 car is not terribly hurt. I'm really concerned about the other car. Frankie Montecalvo. We'll have to wait and see if there was contact. But boy, oh boy. See if we can have a look at what happened. Frankie Montecalvo has climbed out. And they're oh, climbing that's, out. That's really good to see. Glory oh, be, fantastic. David Ostell of Canada. That is really good to see. Wow. Wow, that's a testimony to that carbon fiber tub and how strong that is. That was a massive hit. One of last year's winning drivers in class. And quite a debris field, as you see. Yeah, this will take some cleaning up. There's a it's replay. A look. He's a little bit wide. There's a bit of damage to the left rear. That's why. Way out in the gray, and then Monte Calvi had nowhere to go. Yep. You can't turn from there either. Once you're at that point of the racetrack where you're already on the throttle. To the tire wall and the secondary impact. Yeah, there's nothing. Even bigger than the first. He's just wide all the way through, Dorsey. Got into the gray. Yeah, he got into the gray, and the car wouldn't turn. It pushed straight out to the wall. Monte Carvel had nothing he could do. He was already on the throttle and had planned his exit. Both drivers, of course, wearing the mandatory safety device known as the Hans, the head and neck support system that prevents the driver's head from being strained on his neck beyond bearing. Look at that. And he walked away. Yeah, that is that is used up. That's as bad as I've seen one of these, Calvin, actually. Wasn't a big forward hit. It was like he kind of yeah. hit it with the side and then drug the tires out. So I think it looks, I mean, it was a big wreck. Don't get me wrong. The back, looks hit, was, the, yeah. the back hit was the bad one, you know. Yeah. And luckily it hit at the rear axle, not in the not in the driver's exactly compartment. Exactly the point I was going to make to her is he hit where you had a crushable structure mm -hmm. between the incoming car and the driver cockpit of the one being hit. The debris I mean, field is massive, of course, but... You You're right, Calvin. To dissipate like that. If he wasn't out there in the gray area with all that junk, he would probably made the corner still. But it, once you get out there, the car will not turn anymore. And you saw it just, it got in kind of light into the tires, but it kind of sucked it in once it hit with the left front. It becomes a game of chicken. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you, you can't You just got to give it up. And uh, you can't afford to take any chances. And I'm not saying he was, but just got out wide and made a little mistake there. But um, you got to give up the throttle, try and control the speed a little bit to get it back. Tire wall took a huge hit. That'll have to be rebundled. Let's take another look. As you pointed out, Calvin, there was some damage at the back of Ostella's car, which might not have turned as well as it should have. Yeah, he clearly was in the dirty part of the racetrack. That's mm -hmm. when the car just started going straighter. It appears like it goes straighter. Actually, what it does is it quits turning. Yeah. And that, it caught that left front, and that kind of turned the front end, so it wasn't like a head-on, you know, mm -hmm. full force impact there. So Stella goes round, and there, the car gets hit at the back. Montecalvo. He was lucky not to hit the pit right. wall, you know. Without control, straight across the track. That's the best thing I've seen today, right there. And that's, that could have been so bad for him to get out. It's a great relief. They'll be sore, but they are safe. And that's the best news of all. So out comes the yellow flag once again. There's Gunnar Jeanette on the left. Frankie Montecalvo's longtime driving partner. Another break coming up.
folks out in Green Park wondering, what was that all about? Stay with us. Just about 2.30 Eastern time, seven hours, 45 minutes of change remaining in what has already been a very eventful 60-second running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. There is one of the Corvettes limping around as we are under our sixth caution of the day. Flat left rear, and he that, probably ran over debris from yeah, that wreck, I would that, think. That would be my guess. A massive two-car accident on the start-finish straightaway coming off the final corner has led to yet another yellow flag here in the first half of the 12 hours. At this stage, you've just got to go slow enough yeah. not to do any bodywork damage, particularly to that inner fender. There's ducting and all sorts of uh, coolers and stuff back there, so you just Plus, have to really be patient. Plus, he's safe because the yellow's out. Nobody can pass him. He can go as slow as he wants to. I mean, there's nobody going to do anything, so you just limper on back. And there's no prescribed speed that the team can tell you. It's up to the driver to really just gauge. It's lost most of the carcass already. It looks like it's running on just the outer bead. So maybe there's a big carcass laying out there somewhere. But in any event, you know, he, under yellow, he, nobody can do a thing. Look at all that. Look at the rubber. Holy moly. Wow. wow. Well, remember, we had, uh, we've had a couple of cars limp through there on flat tires. Yeah. Most recently, the Audi. The, the Audi. Yeah. yeah. I think that was maybe where he uh, shred some of that. There's the tire carcass. Now they're calling for a red flag. Okay, that all means stop. They're stopping the race. What's going to happen here is that they're going to bring all the cars to the stop. They can't be worked on. They can't be touched. Drivers will stay in the car unless told otherwise. No work on the cars. No work on the cars whatsoever. They might let the drivers out because this is going to be an extended cleanup period right now. Clock continues to run. Clock continues to run. So even though Briscoe needs service with that Corvette, they'll have to wait to be able to do that. Sure, they're going to bring him down the front straight away here because pit lane is uh, entrance is a bit. Yeah, it's kind of a tough situation up, to call so, right uh, now because you got wrecks in pit lane and you got wreck on the straightaway. And I'm relatively certain that I the, think that's the, uh, is that Briscoe in picture right there. Yeah, he's I think it is, staying yeah. out with. Uh, he's going to. They're going to line him up on the front straightaway. Well, I think they're being down. smart here. If he's not doing damage, to the race car lamp is stacked up behind the pack, so he's essentially almost making up a lap that he would have lost. Do you know what I mean? In in, in distance at least by. Uh, just cruising around and getting up to the back of the pack and then being under a red flag condition. And that is the better of the two cars. Mm. Great to see Camp Boggy Creek on board, but I'm sure they didn't want to see their car in this type of situation. Poor Frankie didn't have anything he could really do about that. He was just wrong place, right time. The front end of that car would have a cone-shaped crushable structure up front. That has already done its job and spared the car and driver to a large extent. Let's go to Chris Neville. Well, Bob, uh, down at the Corvette group, uh, Danny Banks, a bit happy that we've gone to red here because as we've been taking a look at that entrance to pit lane, a lot of blockage down there. So that three car with that tire gone flat, uh, he was concerned that they were going to have to keep going around out there and possibly beat up some body work, possibly beat up some suspension on that car. So when we went to red flag, Danny, Danny Banks held his fists up. He was happy about that, and, and, and hopefully they can slowly get that car back around the racetrack. And, Hopefully, pit lane will be open by the time uh, the three car gets back here. But this team obviously uh, having a tough day. Only the fifth, uh, fourth red flag in the history of this race going back to 1952, twice for rain in 1993 and 95. Okay, we were both in that those, one. yeah. You, you and I were both. The 90s that. were a busy decade because we also had a heavy crash in 97 that brought out the red. I wasn't in that one, but Dorsey probably created the crash. No, yeah, well, probably no. his fault. Huh? You and I were in the one with the rain, though. I remember sitting oh, on pit lane. That was ridiculous. Yeah, it was absolutely ridiculous. Remember, even under caution, you couldn't keep the car on the racetrack, just aquaplaning. No, you got, at like 60 miles an hour, you were over your head. 60? It could have been uh, that big wreck might have been Davy Jones back then in the Jaguar, who had a huge wreck. See, the car is coming to a stop on the Ullman straightaway between turns 16 and 17. Let's go back now and listen to radios on board the number four after the accident. Whoa. Definitely, you know, hit something, debris. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, I mean, I must have been millimeters from the Viper there. See, not much you can do about this. You've, you've got to drive up the straightaway because there's a crash and pit in, and there's debris ah. everywhere. 
He did definitely get into something. There goes the car, soon to discover leaking air. Let's go to Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm with Frankie Montecalvo. Unbelievable, you walked away from that. A little bit red in the face, but I just saw your hands not even shaking, Frankie. No, no, I was just a little more uh, disappointed. We had a good car, you know, we were staying out of trouble and just trying to run my own race out there and stay stay clean. There's a lot of yellows, you know, so far. So we've been, been fortunate enough to stay out of it until then. But... Uh, our car was getting better and better over a stint. You know, I had a lot of understeer, but uh, it started coming to me at the end. We started doing faster laps and just got caught up and had nowhere to go. So yeah, just just go through it. Tell us exactly what you saw. Um, well, I think it was uh, Ostella and Ranger. Uh, they were you know racing wheel to wheel, really racing hard. So I was just trying to stay out of their out of their race and trying to keep my pace up. And uh, it was going into 17. They broke really late. They were both carrying good speed through the corner. Just kind of did a normal line through there and was getting a good exit, was tracking all the way out to the wall. And when I came around the corner, you know, he clipped the wall and spun right out in front of me. So I had nowhere to go. Frank, I'm glad you say, Mr. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was not a fun ride. Okay. That's good to hear Frankie Montecalvo. He's probably still wondering what just happened to me. Yeah, well, he was trying to stay out of that battle. He said the two cars ahead of him were dicing it out and he didn't want any part of it and ultimately ended up in it. So that's uh, that's disappointing. It definitely says, like you said, Calvin, a lot for the design and the crushable structure on the nose of these things that you can have an impact of that severity and, and still the driver be all right. Looks like the crews are going to work back there on the Ullman Strait, cleaning up some of that tire debris. You also had a look at air conditioning, prototype style. <laughs> Just yeah. open the door. I'm sure it's warm in those cars right now. You know, mm. it's, it's probably upper 70s today. Any concerns about overheating your car? You pull it up, you stop. Well, there, there, there's a heat sink heat for sink, sure. Yep. When they shut them off out there, there's, they're going to get really hot, and some of them might not fire. Now, if it doesn't fire, they are allowed to push you and restart it since they've commanded that you shut it down. That's Al Carter and one of the Audi R8s trying to flap some cooling air into the car. You shut it off, and all that heat from the transmission tunnel comes right up from the inside, and it just boils you. No air circulation whatsoever. Pardon me. That's Al in his Aston Martin. The Brandy's racing in this year. Well, that's a good point, Darcy, though. The front engine cars in particular. All that stuff just sits there and, you know, the brake rotors, all that heat comes straight up and it all finds its way to the driver. Uh, most of it through that transmission tunnel, which is a hollow, is hollow underneath the car, so all the heat goes up into that and it acts like a chimney, you know, just sucks all that heat right up through the where you shift from. See the crew's going to work on the tire wall. You know, I came here for the test, and there was a big accident back in the hairpin that about knocked down the fence. But I noticed that the crews seem to be incredibly well rehearsed at repairing the tire wall and cleaning up the racetrack. We've already seen several episodes of that this weekend. In fact, several since the beginning of this race. They really get the job done here at Sebring. Let's go to Andrew Marriott once again. Yeah, well, I'm with one of the big names in this race, Ryan Hunter Ray. You're sort of, you're, this is your bit of fun, isn't it, driving one of these cars? But Sebring is no fun. Oh, it's uh, it's so challenging out there today. It's a, uh, it's a bit crazy, really, the amount of yellows we've seen. But I absolutely love Sebring. I love the 12 hour, and uh, this is my effectively my home race. So it's great to be here with SRT Viper. We had a great run at uh, at Daytona, and we're looking to to top it here today. But you can see it's uh, it's pretty treacherous out there today. How do you switch your mindset from uh, IndyCars to this? Because that one's the braking distance is completely different. The downforce is completely different. Uh, it must be quite hard to do that. Yeah, and it is more difficult uh, going from a GT car to uh, to the IndyCar. But uh, the prototypes in the past years have been easier to go back and forth. This uh, requires a little bit more changing <laughs> of, of driving style. But, you know, it keeps me sharp, keeps me on my toes. I've always got to be thinking about how I can be a better driver. So I love that part of it. Love working with this team. Because you're going to be staying in Florida because you've got the St. Pete Indy race uh, starts the season. Uh, you're getting ready for that. Good preparations? Yeah, I can't wait for the IndyCar season to start. You know, it was a, a big boost to the series to have Verizon come on. Now it's the Verizon IndyCar series, and uh, there's a lot of good momentum going on there. So we're looking forward to getting St. Pete going and uh, and then heading into May for, for what's going to be a spectacular month at uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Meanwhile, you've got a good chance here because the car is going well and some of your rivals have been hitting each other. Yeah, you know, we changed a lot on the car last night. The two, Mark and uh, Dominic, who have driven it before me, have uh, said that the car is the best it's been all week, so I'm really looking forward to getting in it. No matter what, though, when it's this hot, Sebring's going to be greasy, slick, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be tough to keep it on the track. Right, great to talk to you. Thanks, Jam. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Well, he's right about that. This racetrack gets slimy when it gets hot like it is in the afternoon. It drops off almost two seconds a lap from the morning times and inexperienced crew people who come down here and drivers, they chase their car around trying to get that time back, which it never really went away. It's just the racetrack is by nature that way. As we mentioned during our Mazda news and notes, there was a personnel change at Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. Longtime team manager Tim Keene has moved on. Let's hear from his replacement now. Yeah, Bob. Mike O'Gara taking over the reins on the 01 car this year. And Mike, coming in after Daytona, not really mid-season, but after the season has started and after a lot of development with the car, has that been a challenge? It's been a challenge. It's been a lot of work, but uh, it's pretty impressive what Ford's done in such a short amount of time, uh, especially just from the open test till now, just a couple weeks. Uh, They've, they've made some leaps and bounds uh, with mapping, and uh, we're really, really pleased with the performance of, of the, the Ford and, and, and the car in general. So we're making progress. Uh, got a little late start on Daytona, but we're, uh, we're making progress now. now. You were with the 01 car for the first couple years of the Daytona prototype program, then went over to Sarah Fisher Racing, spent some time in IndyCar, now back over here. Are you excited to be back over here? Um, yeah, the, uh, it was an uh, interesting challenge over at Sarah Fisher Racing. Had a great time and learned a lot. And, Hopefully I can bring some of that management experience back here. Uh, it's uh, nice to join Ganassi again, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we can push this program forward. A lot of speed out of the O2 car right now. You guys have that kind of speed too? Yeah, I think so. We're just kind of biding our time. We've been on different strategies all day. Um, both cars are capable of running quick times. We're just uh, doing it a little different than they are and um, taking our time and see what we got at the end. Yeah, now the cars are rolling. Both these teams starting to gear up for a pit stop. They are on extremely different strategies. When you look at the fastest lap, Sage Karam's car is at a 153.2. Fastest time for the 01 is a 154.8. That is a significant delta between two team cars. So I don't know if they've got kind of a rabbit and uh, tortoise kind of strategy going on here. Makes sure you get at least one of these to the finish. Obviously, Daytona, they had some uh, drama there. Maybe the 01 that's running for the championship. Let's run a slower pace. Try and keep on that lead lap and then let him loose at the end. Mm -hmm. Field coming back around. They'll form up. We expect to get a green flag shortly, so we'll take a break. On the other side, we hope to have something very special for you. Stand by for more on the 62nd Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. 